Universidade Federal Rural de Pernambuco tem como missão construir e disseminar o conhecimento e a inovação por meio de atividades de ensino, pesquisa e extensão. Atenta aos anseios da sociedade, a UFRPE é uma comunidade universitária de 20 mil pessoas que busca consolidar-se como instituição pública de excelência. Com presença marcante em todas as regiões de Pernambuco, a UFRPE possui unidades no litoral, no agreste, na zona da mata e no sertão, além de contar com polos da educação à distância em Pernambuco e na Bahia. Essa distribuição espacial faz da UFRPE uma das instituições de ensino superior com maior inserção na realidade das comunidades em todo o estado. No Recife, onde fica o campus sede, a UFRPE está inserida na Reserva da Mata Atlântica do bairro de Dois Irmãos. No Cabo de Santo Agostinho, o campus das engenharias traz um sistema inovador de formação profissional. No sertão do Pajeú, a UFRPE é um sinal de esperança e oportunidade para os estudantes de Serra Talhada e das cidades vizinhas. Por meio da Unidade Acadêmica de Educação à Distância e Tecnologia, a UFRPE é uma alternativa para jovens de municípios dentro e fora de Pernambuco. Já o Colégio Dom Agostinho Icas, localizado em São Lourenço da Mata, é referência de qualidade nos ensinos de estações experimentais e fazendas didáticas, onde são desenvolvidos projetos nas mais diferentes áreas do conhecimento. Na área da pesquisa, a UFRPE conta com 40 programas de pós-graduação, que disponibilizam ao todo 56 cursos, sendo 38 de mestrado e 18 de doutorado. Com cerca de 170 grupos de pesquisa certificados, foram desenvolvidos em 2017 mais de 1.100 projetos de pesquisas nas mais diversas áreas. O trabalho é dessas ações que mais registra patentes em todo o Brasil. Ao longo de mais de 100 anos desde a sua fundação, a Universidade Federal Rural de Pernambuco tem sido um espaço em que tradição e inovação dialogam em processo permanente. A UFRPE busca dar a sua contribuição na construção de uma sociedade mais justa e solidária, seja na valorização de bens culturais, na problematização da realidade brasileira ou na construção de soluções inovadoras e sustentáveis para os problemas de Pernambuco, do Nordeste e do Brasil. Bom dia a todos, bom dia a todos, bem-vindos a um novo dia do nosso evento, celebrando 50 anos da Semana de Engenheiro de Pesca. Esta vez eh, vamos ter uma programação interessante com o pessoal da Ásia. Né? Teremos hoje de manhã importantes apresentações e hoje de tarde também apresentações sobre o camarão. Na tela nos está esperando já a doutora City, mas eu vou chamar a professora Raquel para fazer a apresentação oficial da doutora City. Bom dia a todos e todas. Vamos ter agora aqui o prazer né, e a honra de ter uma grande pesquisadora, a doutora City Chalé, que é diretora do Instituto de Pesquisas Marinhas de Bornéu, uma das grandes referências que se tem no Sudeste Asiático. A Siti, ela é doutora pela Universidade de Putra, na Malásia, e, enfim, está à frente do Instituto e vai contar um pouco para nós sobre o cultivo de holotúrias. Ok? É, good morning, Siti. Um, Hello, do you hear me? Good morning. Me? Good okay. morning, Maria. We are very honored and so much glad to have you here today. So the screen is all yours from now. Thank you very much. I wish to thank you to uh, uh, 
uh, Professor Alfredo and all the crews, uh, Dr. Uh, Danieli also to Maria and everybody for inviting me to be uh, to share what we did in Malaysia in Sabah Borneo. I hope all the students, all the participants, the viewers can uh, enjoy my presentation and will learn something something new maybe from Malaysia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ela agradeceu a todos a honra, Alfredo, Daniel e os participantes aqui. E ela espera que vocês aprendam com o cultivo de holotúria que ela tem para falar hoje. Nós vamos entrar agora com a palestra. Thank you, Siti. You're welcome. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum to all students, lecturers, and all the participants who's joining us this morning. My name is Siti Raihana Muhammad Saleh from the Borneo Marine Research Institute, University Malaysia Sabah. Firstly, I would like to congratulate the University of Federal Rural of Pernambuco for the celebration of this 50th anniversary. And I would like to express my appreciation to the organiz organizer for this opportunity for being invited to share our work in Sabah, Malaysia uh, with the student in Recife. Thank you very much to Professor Alfredo Olvera for inviting us. At this uh, occasion, at this uh, opportunity, of aquaculture in Sabah, Malaysia. I hope all of you can stay with me until the end of my talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sharing this map, map with you to show you exactly the location of Kota Kinabalu and Recife. So Kota Kinabalu and Recife are separated by ocean and land with estimation about 17,000 kilometers away. That is about two days journey from uh, Sabah to uh, Recife. So this year, uh, uh, Recife, the UFRPE celebrated their Golden Jubilee while for your information, last year, in 2019, UMS celebrated their Silver Jubilee on the establishment of UMS. So you can see we are 25, younger, 25 years younger than UFRPE. We would like to uh, actually thank the technology that has made the globe borderless and allowing us to travel to any destination instantly. For example, now uh, I feel like I am in Recife, although in reality we are at our own location. Well, to start uh, the topic I'm going to share with everybody, I will start with the little introduction on the biology and the taxonomic hierarchy of the sea cucumber. Similar to the sea chain, uh, they uh, and also the starfish, this uh, sea cucumber sharing the same group of phylum that is Echinodermata. Okay? It was classified in the class of Holoturidae and the order of Aspidochirotidae. The circular body of uh, this sea cucumber, the circular body of this cucumber is exactly looks like the, sea, the, the cucumber. And that is how they get the name, I believe. The color of the body uh, is very uh, is very between location, eh? so it can be from gray to black at the dorsal part, and a uh, little bit whitish uh, at the central part. How they move? The locomotion locomotion of this organism is by using their 
uh, tube feet that is made from small papillae at the ventral part. This is a very unique organism. There has no eyes, there is no fin, there is no ears, there is no nose, but yes, of course, they have mouth located at the ventral face, whereas the anus is located dorsally at the posterior end of the body. Okay, everyone, from this map, we can clearly see that the sea cucumber diversity and distribution is concentrated our place in Borneo. So this is Borneo Island. So other than Borneo Island, uh, the sea cucumber diversity also concentrated to the nearby country, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Indonesia. Uh, sandfish is usually found in the inner reef flats in shallow tropical water. They prefer sheltered area with high nutrients, such as the seagrass beds and also the muddy strata. Associated with the sandfish is seagrass. So it's also reported in places like in Papua New Guinea. Where is Papua New Guinea? This is Papua New Guinea. And also the Solomon Islands here, nearby here is the Solomon Island. So, uh, as well also in Australia. So this is where the uh, distribution of the sea cucumber, the world distribution of sea cucumber. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, this uh, slide shows the different species of uh, sea cucumber that's uh, been recorded and reported. So in Malaysia, um, we have total of uh, more than 80 species uh, being reported and recorded from our waters. So what about uh, Brazil? How many species of uh, sea cucumber uh, are there available in, the, in, in Brazil? So according to Prata, uh, she is a very uh, active researcher. She conducted a lot, a lot of study on this uh, Echinodermata, especially in the northeast uh, Brazil at the Paraiba state. She found that there are nine, nine species of Holoturia, Holoturidae uh, found in the Paraiba state. So this species is uh, difficult to identify. You need a special skill and an expert to identify. Um, unlike fish and or shrimp or other, other terrestrial plant, the identification needs the assistance of using microscope. So this species can be identified using microscope examination on the calcareous, uh, on the calcareous uh, plates called the spicules. The spicules of a sandfish or sea cucumber no, normally present in the shape of tables and also uh, buttons. So I hope um, students in Recife can have the chance to learn further detail on how to identify the sea cucumber. Sea cucumber plays important role in creating a clean and healthy ocean floor. How do they do that? From the mixing activity, the sediment mixing, it, it's, uh, it's help in oxygenating the ocean floor. And the habit of these uh, animals, they are like vacuum cleaner. They graze on the detritus and the organic material found in the sediment. So can, can you imagine what will happen to our ocean if the sea cucumber disappear? I leave it to the student to go back and then I think about it. Okay, many of uh, the, the sea cucumber nowadays uh, have been, uh, uh, has been classified under the endangered species, including this Holoturus cabra, the species that I'm going to discuss further detail uh, with all of you uh, today. So the question mark, how? 
How does it happen? Why are they get extinct? Extinct? So let's us uh, discuss now. So okay. Uh, the issue of over exploitation and over fishing of the sea cucumbers are believed to be the strong reason to, for the wild stock depletion. If you look at this map, it is clearly shown that the red colors here, these the red colors showing that the fully and over exploitation. So most of the species activity or the over exploitation of this species is at this area, especially in the tropical uh, waters. So it is reported in Malaysia itself that more than 50% of the, the landing has been depleted for the past uh, 50 years. So why? How does it happen? In adequate management in many countries, I believe, is also one of the reasons in the declining of this uh, population of the sea cucumber. Holotudas cabra, or the common name is sandfish, has been the most famous or most uh, harvested species of sea cucumber in the tropical waters. Sandwich has been consumed as a luxury food by the Asian. You see, in the in the in the high expensive restaurant, seafood, uh, the sea cucumber is sell at a very high price, especially among the Chinese. It is uh, believed to contain, uh, uh, it is due to the high protein and low fat content of the sea cucumber. Um, these photos, if you see here, there are a small, small uh, sea cucumber inside the jar. Actually, this sea cucumber is believed to have high therapeutic and medicinal properties. It's also claimed to uh, reduce arthritis and joint pain uh, in, in a human. And, and not only that, it's also claimed to have this bioactive compound, such as antifungal, anti-cancer, and, and antibacteria. And recently, uh, many people been using sea cucumber as a raw material in their cosmetics. I don't know why it's become very famous now, especially that claim for the beauty, uh, for, for the, for the uh, cosmetics and beauty. Dried sandfish or dried sea cucumber is known as Bechi de Mel, uh, or the dried sea cucumber is, uh, has been exported worldwide with high price, especially at the premium grade. There are many factors uh, that determine the price. For example, the species, different species, okay, give you different price. And other than that, the size, the size of the uh, sea cucumber also determine the price. So in the uh, international market, the dried sandfish uh, can be sold up to 600 uh, US dollar per kilogram. So this photo is taken from uh, our local market in, in, in Kota Kinabalu, and you can imagine how sea cucumber are sold in, uh, in our uh, local market. Ladies and gentlemen, Sabah, Malaysia is very famous for among the tourists as the heaven of seafood. And uh, because of that, the Malaysian government has identified Sabah as the aquaculture hub for Malaysia. In, uh, and in our university, we support the government by conducting research, not only on sea cucumber, but some other important organism, okay? Such as the seaweed. We have a good seaweed cultivation in Sabah. And uh, also, of course, the grouper, the fish, the fin fish. Uh, later, my friend will share about the aquaculture grouper in Sabah, and also the crab. Dr. Anita will uh, share with you about the crab. So crab in Sabah is, uh, I think, as good as what you have in uh, Recife in Brazil. Other than that, we also have this 
giant freshwater prawn. Malaysian giant freshwater prawn. Also, we conducted research in our institute in University of Malaysia Sabah. And finally, we also have researchers doing on the lobster. This is a, another uh, research interest con, uh, in, in our institute. Ladies and gentlemen, in Malaysia, Sabah, this is Sabah. Sabah is the only state that conducted sea cucumber activity. So this photo showing the aerial view of farming uh, activity uh, in uh, Sabah. So if you can see this is, these small things is actually a small hut or small house owned by the farmers. And these, all these things are actually the, the sea pen they use to culture their sea cucumber. So this is the uh, closer view of how this sea pen is made. This is actually made from a mangrove wood, and then some uh, they put nets. So inside the inside the uh, sea pen, there they stock like twenty to thirty thousand of sea cucumber inside. So this is the very normal view of sea cucumber farming in Sabah. Ladies and gentlemen, because the demand, the high demand of sandfish or sea cucumber, the people, the traditional fishermen has, has shown a very a tremendous pattern in culturing sea cucumber in their pens. Okay, if you see from these uh, photos, this is a very uh, common traditional house in Sabah where they have the sea pen nearby their house. And some also uh, the, uh, the traditional farmers using uh, the, together with the sea cage, the fish, and uh, they put some of the sea cucumber. So this is the trend now because of the high demand and high price of sea cucumber, many of the fishermen uh, get into the farming activity. However, sadly, this uh, the seed that they used to to farm at their sea cage is actually a wild caught seeds. So this is the issue that we have to discuss and we have to solve. How can we reduce the wild catch of seed that to be used for the farming? The current situation is not good, where the fishermen harvested the sea cucumber from wild without control. So the government has put up uh, an enforcement on fisheries management, what we call in our local system is the Tagal Balat. So this, uh, this is actually a signage put up to warn people, to warn the fishermen to not uh, catch uh, sea cucumber at certain times and certain zones. This, uh, this police uh, also have to catch the, the thieves uh, uh, who collected our sea cucumber without permission. But however, ladies and gentlemen, enforcement of fisheries management alone cannot uh, overcome the issue. So we need to do um, uh, aquaculture especially hatchery production of the seed to help in uh, solving the declining population of this marine organism. In Borneo Marine Research Institute, starting from 2014, we received a good uh, big research grant to conduct research on the breeding of the sea cucumber. So, uh, we, we conducted a lot of experiment how to establish technique on how to produce the, the small, uh, the, the baby sea cucumber or the seeds of the sea cucumber. Uh, we conducted a lot of uh, research including uh, the breeding technique, artificial breeding technique, the rearing technique, and also uh, including the feeding, the type of feeding suitable for the sea cucumber, and then, and then finally, we also conducted a study on stock enhancement and sea ranching program. 
what is a stock enhancement and a sea ranching program is we produce the seed in our hatchery, our very own hatchery, and we plan to release the uh, seed back into the environment, back to the wild, and then after certain uh, uh, month or years, we return back and then we check if the population of the sea cucumber increase or start to decline. So for the breeding program, we approach the community to give training on how to produce their sea, sea cucumber seeds. Okay, if I can share with you here from this photo, I can show you. So this is how the, the sea pen, where this community, this group of people using rock that they collect from uh, the coral and we don't encourage them to do that because by doing that they might uh, destroy the coral okay so some of the participants are also involved in in technique how to uh, build the sea pen properly and um, discussion among uh, the community and the scientists uh, to teach how can we produce the baby sea cucumber in captivity inside a tank so some of these interested uh, uh, fellow to look at these uh, brood stock uh, are ready for the uh, what do you call it a breeding program this uh, lady this old lady actually she processed her own sea cucumber that he that they caught from wild and then they're selling it with a very low uh, low quality low grade because of the process is not to produce a premium quality of a dried sea cucumber. Well, now let us go into the technique, artificial breeding technique. So um, in Borneo Modern Research Institute, uh, we use three combination of uh, technique in uh, uh, induction method, which is the uh, desiccation, we allow the rootstock to dry, to put them under stress, but not uh, um, too long to dryness, like 30 minutes. And also we use uh, heat, water temperature uh, shock to, to induce the sea cucumber to spawn. Other than that, we also use technique with using feed stimulant. So we use... Uh, Spirulina is a feed stimulant that will induce the sea cucumber to spawn. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information, uh, artificial breeding of sea cucumber is very depending on the quality of the brood stock. So we need a matured, really, really matured uh, brood stock to be induced in the hatchery. So although in tropical uh, country, uh, tropical waters, the, the, the trend of the spawning is continuously throughout the years. However, from our observation, we understand that uh, month like July, August, May, November, these are the stage uh, where time, a good time for induced spawning to be conducted because at this time most of the wild uh, sea cucumber wild broodstock are ready to spawn it is so meaningless if you uh, you induce the unready broodstock or the not matured uh, broodstock because they will never spawn any eggs Okay, the first stage in the uh, artificial breeding or uh, the induced spawning process is the selection of the brood stock. So in our case, we obtain the brood stock from the fishermen. The fishermen help us to collect a good uh, brood stock. The, so the first thing we have to check is to make sure that there is no lesions on the skin. 
Okay. Secondly, we have to check if the skins are all healthy or not. We need to avoid this these two situation where the skin is darkened and then some lesion. So we need to get a very healthy uh, brood stock. Another issue is that we have to be careful with the pea crabs. This pea crab is uh, the parasite for the sea cucumber. And then once the uh, brood stock been infected by parasitic uh, pea crab, it is not good. Your sea cucumber is not healthy. So the the next uh, the next uh, criteria is how can we transport the brood stock from uh, from the community and back into our hatchery in our plant. So proper packaging is important. You need to use a pure oxygen to help in the transportation. So my student with us, uh, with using this um, box, styrofoam, uh, styrofoam box, uh, to reduce the the uh, uh, the stress during transportation because it takes like three to four hours to reach uh, our university from uh, from the uh, the fishermen. So next. Uh, the, what what else that we need uh, for the uh, preparation and then upon arrival arrival at the hatchery we need to prepare the brood stock tank okay if you see this is a brood stock tank and then it is very shallow okay it's uh, we, we supply with the filtered water and then actually inside there we we, uh, we put a uh, sand uh, treated sand to uh, follow the the natural environment of the sea cucumber. So this is a view showing um, in our uh, hatchery in uh, in Borneo Marine Research Institute. This uh, this slide actually uh, is the summary the summary of um, the process eh, the protocol of how to conduct the spawning induction. The brood stock that we use is um, around 200 to 300 grams, quite big. And then we start for the uh, process. After returning from the fisherman, we need to uh, keep the brood stock uh, for acclimatization at least three to uh, five days before we can start to do the uh, induced spawning. So we follow this first one, we do the desiccation. We leave them to dry outside of the water uh, at least 30 minutes. With this uh, condition, it can trigger trigger the brood stock to spawn. So after that, we put them inside the uh, tank with some uh, thermal shock. We increase the temperature 4 to 5 degrees Celsius and then leave it to one hour and then we need to observe observe the behavior of this uh, the brood stock at this time if they are spawning or not if they don't spawn if they don't spawn we will continue with the stage number three we are using spirulina powder and then as the feed stimulants to uh, to force the sea cucumber uh, to to spawn. So this is uh, in general the three protocols of uh, induction. Okay, after all the procedure, the protocol in the induced uh, spawning, we have to observe carefully. We have to wait and see near the tank how the sea cucumber behave. Actually, at normal situation, they if they are not ready to spawn, they will love to just stay like that but if they are ready to spawn these two sea cucumber are ready to spawn observe here you look at here this is the male this is the male sea cucumber they release the sperm slowly from the head part you can see white color there and then this is the female this is the female Okay, the female will take uh, several minutes before it's ready to release the eggs. 
okay this is how unique this animal so from here only you can observe or you can differentiate which species which one is female which one is male the success uh, spawning couples is now we need to wait at least one to two hours before all the eggs fertilize so here i show you how to we need to look under the microscope actually you can see with your naked eyes and then we need to count how many eggs by using uh, buckets and then also uh, using uh, beaker we need to determine the number of eggs fertilized so we have to look under the microscope uh, uh, we need to check on the uh, development of the uh, embryonic development of the eggs okay so we can observe starting from the newly fertilized egg until they all complete the blastula stage so during the training uh, to the community and also to our student these are the thing that they have to very critically looking at because we want them to know how to differentiate differentiate the good eggs and the bad eggs okay so good eggs will hatch as a good uh, larvae the successfully hatched uh, eggs need a very extra because this is the stage where the larvae need an extra super extra extra care in the hatchery okay they are very fragile and then um, many study uh, reported that this the successful or the survival rate is very low it's less uh, from our experience we have less than one percent of survival and then we try to understand how can we improve the survival rate and then one of the factor that we studied is to study the best diet what are the best diet for the sea cucumber okay now i have another short video to share with you this this video uh, showing the newly hatched uh, sea cucumber eggs okay we can understand that at this stage at gastrula stage the larvae don't feed yet so but we have to be careful because the transformation or the metamorphosis into the next stage is very fast if we miss that first feeding stage all the larvae will die ladies and gentlemen there is this is another short video showing the larvae stage of auricularia at this stage uh, we uh, the, the larvae are actively feeding on uh, microalgae so from our study we found that uh, giving uh, them with nanochloropsis uh, will delay the uh, the metamorphosis from late auricularia into the next stage which is the do, 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 doliolaria sorry the doliolaria stage and from other study also they shows that high lipid uh, microalgae for example the diatom catocerus is good because it can help in the development of the hyaline spear in the auricularia that enhance the metamorphosis let us watch how this uh, uh, this uh, larvae moving so okay so feeding them with uh, microalgae also cannot be too much because they are filter feeders too much microalgae will deteriorate the water easily and also when too much microalgae inside it will uh, disturb the ingestion and digestion of the microalgae so we need to count exactly how much uh, microalgae needed okay in this slide i want to uh, share some of the routine works in the hatchery uh, during the larvae larvae culture of the 
uh, sea cucumber. We need to give uh, feeding twice daily. Uh, at the early stage of the uh, larval stage, we need to give them nanochloropsis and cathocerus. Navicula is given later when they start to settle at the bottom because we know that Navicula is a benthic uh, diatom. So the water quality is very important. We need to monitor it closely. We need to check the quality of the water twice a day, in the morning and also in the afternoon. For every two days, we have to slowly change the water. This is to reduce any uh, ammonia or unwanted nitrogenous compound content in the water from 20 to 30, 40 percent. This is, uh, it is uh, very tricky. We have to be careful because the larvae are very super tiny. We don't want to uh, suck out all these larvae. Counting and observa observation of the larva development is very important because we need to know what to feed, what is the next stage of this, for the next stage of the, uh, the sea cucumber. So I, I show with you here some of the uh, range of the parameters uh, suitable for uh, larva rearing. And then uh, in, the, in our hatchery, in our hatchery, we have uh, a rule, our uh, diatom, and then we have uh, established some of the uh, diet uh, uh, stock for the uh, sea cucumber. To conduct the lava rearing, we need to prepare a special tank uh, for the lava rearing. The collected eggs uh, will, will be uh, incubated in this uh, lava tank. And as you can see here, the, we put net. Actually, this is uh, like a mosquito net. This is the uh, chironomid uh, life cycle. And as an adult, they are like mosquitoes. So we need to stop it from entering the tank because this will burrow inside the baby sea cucumber. So the water, we have to remember that the water source inside the world must be treated. You need to uh, filter it properly, at least one micron uh, water filtered, and then it is good if you can pass it through the UV uh, light treatment. So this is a very uh, basic uh, technique of uh, lava rearing uh, uh, facility. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the the full life cycle of sea cucumber. The, we start with the uh, fertilized eggs and then the pelagic phase, eh? which means that they all stay in the water column. Then after completion, uh, the oleolara stage, and then it start to settle at the epibenthic. Actually, they start to settle at the bottom. And then they will attach to any uh, structure that has enough food for them. This is the pentactula stage. The pentactula stage will uh, grow into become uh, a juvenile, okay, before they are ready to be, to transfer into the hapa or the uh, nursery stage. Actually, um, in one year or one year and a half, the full cycle can complete as an adult or ready to spawn. Like other marine organisms, uh, larva stage is the most critical stage. So, uh, uh, various factors need to be uh, tackled uh, and then need to be uh, at the optimum level such as the uh, food availability, the proper appropriate stocking density. We cannot have a very high stocking density larvae and the water temperature and the salinity as well as the uh, water quality in total. So actually, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have still a lot more to study. The gap knowledge is still there and then we need to 
further do uh, some investigation to establish the technique and to make the breeding successful. So ladies and gentlemen, I think we have uh, come to the end of my uh, talk. So to end my talk, I want to uh, conclude some of the topic that we have covered, discussed. And for me, for myself, uh, I, I want all of you to agree with me that hatchery seed production is necessary to uh, ensure the sustainability and the continuous supply of sand fish throughout the years. Because if you want to uh, make aquaculture, sand fish aquaculture, a sea cucumber uh, aquaculture a success, seed production, hatchery seed production is extremely needed. And the program like stock enhancement uh, need to be conducted to recover the depleted wild stock and also to control the over exploitation of this species. The government need to uh, conduct um, a proper management how to control the overfishing activities by the fishermen. Okay, awareness among the community need to be uh, implemented. And then um, this is how we can ensure that our Sea floor, our uh, ocean can stay healthy as what we want it to be. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much to all students, lecturers, and participants for listening. Terima kasih. Mucho obrigado. We wish you all the best and hope to see you again next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ok, é, então, é, bom dia novamente a todos. É, nós temos diversas perguntas aqui, de fato foi uma palestra muito, muito interessante e a gente vai ter que selecionar algumas das perguntas, ok? Só um instante, vamos entrar agora em contato com City. City? Hello? Hello, so City. I can, yes, I can on my microphone. Ok. Do you, do you want me to switch on the video? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, ok. Só um instante. Ok, do you hear me? Yes, can. Clear. Ok. City, this was a wonderful, wonderful speak you had. We are so Thank much you. curious about lots of things. There are many questions here and we are trying to select some of them. Wow, okay. you have so um, many questions. A, a wonderful research, really. It's something completely unusual for us and unexpected. Um, well, I have some questions here, so let's go to the first one. One percent is really of survivor is, is really too low level. So we were wondering 
uh, how do you measure the success of your restocking program? Yes, Let me you are right. Yes. Okay. You, you, Let me just... You, re re oh, okay. Just let me do it this in Portuguese so the, the audience can, can understand. É, pessoal, então, a minha pergunta, o trabalho é fantástico, é um trabalho enorme, né, de formiguinha, né, 1% de sobrevivência é realmente muito pouco. Então, a primeira pergunta que eu faço para ela é de que modo ela mede esse sucesso do repovoamento, tá? Então, vou passar para ela agora. Ok, so you can answer the question. Yeah, you are true. One uh, percent is very, very, very low percent. But to compare with fish, which you can get maybe forty percent and above, but this is one percent considered good enough. And then actually, uh, because um, the aquaculture, the seed production in in hatchery is not common is not yes uh, is not yet well established so if you can get one percent is considered good enough even my experience because we do it for research not for commercial one percent is uh is just sufficient for our study but for commercialization we need to if you can get above one considered good enough Yeah. Ok. É, então, ela diz que realmente é, é uma coisa muito difícil né, de se fazer, é algo completamente novo, e que eles estão felizes com esse 1%, certo? É, vou fazer uma outra pergunta aqui, é, que é sobre... A razão sexual. Me parece, né, pelo que nós vimos aí no, no vídeo, que a razão sexual do que está ali no tanque de reprodutores só é conhecida no momento em que a desova está ocorrendo. Então, eu pergunto agora, eu vou perguntar agora a ela se essa razão sexual, se ela for muito distinta de uma esperada, de um para um, se... So, Siti, the second question is, uh, do you actually know the sex ratio just at the moment you were doing the, 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 the breeders are spawning? At that time, you know the sex ratio, right? Oh, this is a bonus question. Actually, this uh, animal, you cannot, you don't know the sex from the beginning. You cannot differentiate which one is female, which one is, until they spawn, until they release sperm or they release eggs. So that's why when you first time doing it, you maybe use a lot of male, no female. So you need to, uh, you know, uh, group them. Your first experience when you know which one is male, you have to divide them. You have to keep the male into one special tank and the female into one special tank. But actually uh, for spawning, for a good spawning, you just need less uh, male. You don't need a lot of male because too much sperm inside the tank will deteriorate the water. So normally uh, if, if at that time you have many male, You have to take out straight away because we don't want the water become very murky, a lot of sperm inside. So you you will only allow two, one or two male is enough. But the female, the more you have is better because the eggs, you need the eggs more. So this is the challenge because you don't know which one is male, which one is female. It's based on your luck at that time. So does it answer? Yeah, but what I was worried about was when we we do restocking, here in Brazil we have a lot of actions, restocking actions going on. Basically not 
never ever on in sea just for continental waters for fish mm -hmm. and one of the things we are very much worried about is the ratio because sometimes you use a lot of uh, these species uh, aquatic species normally they are very they give many eggs mm -hmm. and so sometimes you can get a lot of larvae but they descended from a few parents so that's mm -hmm. the point i was worried about the sex ratio between the male and, and female if this was near one to one but in your case the male sperm will let the water too dirty something like that and it's not good for the eggs right yeah. so i was uh, worried about that sex ratio but it's something that's completely out of your control you can decrease the number of males and then you you because uh, i'm worried about the, the the diversity the genetic diversity here that's yeah. the point I was... Let me first translate this to Portuguese. Então, ela, como ela falou, é, ela não tem o controle sobre isso. Ela só vai saber quem é macho e quem é fêmea na hora que eles estiverem desovando. Se tiver muito macho na água, essa água vai ficar turva e vai ficar suja. E isso acaba atrapalhando, de certa forma, de alguma maneira, aí, pela experiência deles, a fertilização. Então, ela prefere usar mais fêmeas do que machos, certo? Esse é o ponto dela. Mas, realmente, não se tem controle ah, sobre essa razão sexual, certo? É, ok, another question we have here, just a minute. Um, it's a question from Equador. It's the, the person who was, is watching us from Ecuador. And he asks us, how long do you think it's going to take to develop um, aquaculture technological package, let's say, uh, uh, when this technology will be available so the world can make the sea cucumber restocking or aquaculture production? Let me just ask this in Portuguese. A pergunta em português foi, em quanto tempo nós teríamos um pacote tecnológico para desenvolver a aquicultura dessa espécie? Ok, Siti. Ok. Um, this is... Uh, well, let me tell you. Even in Malaysia, we are known for our aquaculture. But our study on sandfish aquaculture is just started and i can say that none it's like almost not no hatchery that has an established technique so um we know that like in fiji in madagascar some of the indonesia also but because um the interest is little that's why the study is little although we know the price of this is have a very good price in malaysia i don't know why why they don't do it earlier much earlier until today there is no established hatchery and if we, we if we want to get uh, the seed from fiji from sri lanka from the uh, Madagascar, it's difficult to get. They also don't West, well establish. Even our our neighbor in the Philippines, in Iloilo, we learned it from Iloilo. Malaysia went to Iloilo, see if they Philippines to learn. They also themselves don't have the well established. It all depends on many factors unlike fish unlike shrimp and uh, crab the technique is ready ready for everybody to use but not this uh, sea cucumber so we still need more more many more years to, to you know to do to research and say. yes mm. so it's a it's a very uh, it's a pity to the aquaculture 
Ok. É, então, traduzindo aqui rapidamente, e essa vai ter que ser a nossa última pergunta por conta do horário, ela diz que realmente é muito difícil, o pacote ainda está no seu início, né? que são as primeiras pessoas que estão desenvolvendo, na verdade eles foram a, a Iloilo, que fica nas Filipinas, para aprender como é que se fazia isso, só que eles hoje estão mais avançados do que a Iloilo, e assim, essa taxa de sobrevivência de 1% talvez seja a melhor que existe, ela disse que existem outros lugares como a Indonésia, Madagascar, até ela comentou, e outros lugares da Malásia tentando, mas que até aqui parece né, que esse é o melhor resultado. Então, está longe ainda de se ter um pacote tecnológico. Ok. É... Eu vou, então, agora encerrar aqui, agradecer a ela, porque nós temos que entrar na palestra seguinte, ok? Dr. City, thank you so much. It was a wonderful lecture we had here today. But unfortunately, we have to finish this, so the next presentation will start. Okay? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Para inovar no aproveitamento integral do pescado, é necessário para abrir novas opções de consumo. O LATPES, que é um laboratório de ensino, pesquisa e desenvolvimento que faz parte do DEPAC e da UFRPE. A área de tecnologia do pescado se faz presente no curso de engenharia de pesca, como parte importante de um ensino abrangente que permita que os nossos alunos conheçam o necessário sobre processar e conservar o pescado. Assim, o laboratório encarregado de complementar as aulas teóricas das disciplinas de aproveitamento integral do pescado e controle qualidade e conservação de produtos pesqueiros, onde os alunos são apresentados a diversas técnicas da tecnologia do pescado, como a filetagem, salga, defumação e até a elaboração de produtos como fish burgers, empanados e embutidos. Nossa equipe é composta por alunos de graduação e pós-graduação, profissionais com diversas formações e graduações. Nosso trabalho se pauta em três grandes áreas de investigação. A primeira, aproveitamento de resíduos do pescado. A segunda, o desenvolvimento de produtos. E a terceira, qualidade do pescado e produtos derivados. Olá! O LATPESC, Laboratório de Tecnologia do Pescado, foi criado em 2013. Nesse ano, aprovamos um projeto junto ao CNPq edital universal, para elaboração de linguiças utilizando o bagre marinho, que é uma espécie de baixo valor comercial, porém muito abundante no litoral pernambucano. Com esse projeto, nós conseguimos comprar equipamentos importantes para uh, melhorar uh, o nosso laboratório, como freezers, uh, banho-maria e também embutideira. Bom, Através desse projeto, alunos de graduação e pós-graduação puderam desenvolver os seus trabalhos. Um outro marco para o nosso laboratório foi em 2015, onde conseguimos aprovar, junto à FACEP, um projeto para desenvolver embutidos tipo salsicha utilizando o saramonete, que é uma espécie valorizada no litoral pernambucano. Nesse projeto, nós conseguimos comprar Uh, também outros equipamentos importantes, como a máquina de CMS, moedor de carne, estufa BOD. Então, uh, com isso, melhorando ainda mais a estrutura do nosso laboratório. Atualmente, o laboratório conta com a participação de alunos uh, de graduação, de PIBIC e de pós-graduação, onde eles vêm desenvolvendo trabalhos importantes com a elaboração de produtos inovadores, com aproveitamento de resíduos, que com isso poderão melhorar a situação de todo o setor. No futuro, pretendemos continuar desenvolvendo trabalhos na área de desenvolvimento de produtos inovadores, principalmente utilizando espécies de baixo valor comercial, aproveitamento de resíduos do, do processamento pesqueiro, com isso diminuindo os resíduos que eram lançados ao meio ambiente, e além de agregar valor a esses resíduos. E também um outro ponto que nós estamos investindo bastante é através das tecnologias inovadoras, como, por exemplo, o uso do ultrassom. 
aonde nós poderemos agregar valor aos produtos e fornecer um produto de melhor qualidade. Com isso tudo, esperamos uh, contribuir um pouco para a, o aumento do consumo de pescado no Brasil. Olá, eu sou Clara Emily Beckman Vieira, aluna da turma 1 de 1988, daquele vestibular catastrófico em que uma questão errada anulava uma questão correta, e por isso foram poucas pessoas que entraram na maioria dos cursos da Federal Rural. A minha turma teve 14 pessoas naquela época, mas uma turma muito boa que se integrou fácil com outras turmas que estavam em andamento na época. né? Estou aqui para falar um pouquinho em comemoração aos 50 anos do curso de Engenharia de Pesca. Eu nasci junto com o curso, né? mais ou menos na mesma época, então também celebro meus 50 anos esse ano. E queria falar para vocês quais foram minhas motivações e um pouquinho sobre o curso. né? Então, minhas principais motivações para a escolha do curso de Engenharia de Pesca na época foram o amor pelo mar e a admiração pelos ambientes costeiros e aquáticos. né? E, na época, eu tinha um ideal de contribuir para a redução da fome. né? Meu pai disse para mim, você pode produzir alimento a baixo custo né? para qualquer pessoa ter um alimento de qualidade a um preço acessível. E acho até que isso é possível até hoje, basta dedicação né? e estratégias para que isso aconteça. Mas as minhas principais dedicações foram na área da sustentabilidade pesqueira, né? na oceanografia pesqueira. Então, eu trabalhei pela sustentabilidade de algumas espécies, e até hoje é um valor que permanece e eu pratico, né? eu sou cofundadora e voluntária do Instituto Educacional para a Vida Sustentável, então trabalho essa questão da sustentabilidade de diferentes maneiras. Queria registrar né, os meus elogios ao curso de Engenharia de Pesca e minha gratidão. Eu acho que aquele ditado representa muito bem o significado do valor do curso de Engenharia de Pesca, que é engenheiro é pau para toda obra, né? como se diz. E quem se dedicou, a gente está aí vendo as histórias de sucesso para comprovar né? aos colegas, aos amigos que fizeram uma carreira linda e deram grandes contribuições. É, nós tivemos professores de altíssimo nível, gente, inclusive eu fui fazer uma segunda graduação e é decepcionante, né? não dá para comparar, mas para não correr risco de esquecer de ninguém, eu não vou falar os vários nomes dos excelentes professores que tivemos, mas queria destacar a professora Liana e o programa especial de treinamento, eu fui da primeira turma selecionada, eu e mais três colegas, para o PET, na, uh, em, ainda em 88, a gente teve essa oportunidade de ser inserida na iniciação científica bem cedo. E eu tenho muito a agradecer ao programa e à professora Liana, que contribuiu significativamente, não somente na minha formação profissional, mas na minha formação como pessoa, pelo exemplo que a professora Liana dá até hoje, né, de competência, de comprometimento, de seriedade, um bom humor muito inteligente que ela tem até hoje, né? E, enfim, lembrando inclusive que ela e o professor Ayrton, junto com outros empreendedores, foram os construtores, os empreendedores do curso de engenharia de pesca. Então, devemos todos nossa gratidão a eles. É, queria destacar também a questão da formação científica né, que o curso de engenharia trouxe para a minha vida. Eu acho que isso é o que há de mais significativo. Inclusive, eu vivencio na prática o processo de autocientificidade no meu dia a dia. Né? Então, isso é um, um valor muito relevante e trazido pela minha formação em engenharia de pesca. E queria finalizar aqui com meus agradecimentos e minha gratidão ao companheirismo, à parceria, à convivência sadia que tive com os professores e com os meus colegas das turmas anteriores à minha e posteriores também. 
Então, são pessoas que eu carrego no meu coração e no meu livro de credores também. Felizmente, tenho um contato com alguns ainda, né? Mas saibam que a todos sou muito grata e desejo muitos sucessos a quem estiver ingressando e ainda com a sua formação em curso, no grande curso de Engenharia de Pesca. Oh. Gostaria de convidar a todos e a todas para a palestra intitulada Cultivo e Conservação do Caranguejo de Manguezal. E para tal, gostaria de convidar o moderador, o professor doutor William Severi. Professor, por favor. Obrigado, professora Suziane. Bom dia a todos e todas. Como já anunciado previamente pela professora, a palestra que se segue será feita pela doutora Anita eh, Young, a doutora Anitta é bacharel em Biologia da Conservação, com mestrado e PhD em Aquicultura. Tá? Tem como área principal de pesquisa nutrição na aquicultura, com experiência no cultivo de crustáceos. Okay? A doutora Anitta atualmente é, atua no Borneo Marine Research Institute, Instituto de Pesquisa Marinha de Borneo, da University of Malaysia, Sabah. A doutora Anitta tem mais de 60 artigos publicados na área, e vai nos brindar hoje, então, com a sua palestra Cultivo e Conservação de Caranguejo do Maranzal. Dr. Anitta, you are already there? Maybe you could show it. Yes, okay. hi. Nice to have you here, okay? Thank you. you. It's my, our pleasure. Then we are going to start your presentation, okay? Sure. Thank you. Then, after the presentation, we have some questions that I'm going to translate so you can, you can answer them. Okay? Sure, thank you. See you later then. Yeah, all right. Ok. Bom, então, uh, vamos dar início à apresentação da doutora Anitta e na sequência uh, teremos uma sessão de perguntas. Ok? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Anita Shokin Yong from Borneo Marine Research Institute. First of all, I'd like to thank Prof. Alfredo for inviting me to share some of my experience and research on mangrove crab. The topic that I will share with you today is on some of the issues and challenges in aquaculture mangrove crab production. Let me introduce a bit of our institute. Borneo Marine Research Institute is one of the Center of Excellence in University of Malaysia, established as a research institute about 20 years ago in the year 2000. We have two major research fields in our institute. One is aquaculture and another one is marine science. The picture here below here shows the overview of our research, uh, research institute. We have um, two in-campus uh, hatchery that uh, Firstly, take uh, not only the teachings and learning of the undergrad student, but also for postgrad study and research. The figure here shows the um, one of the hatchery, the fish hatchery, in our institute. The target of my uh, talk today is a mangrove crab. A uh, mangrove crab, or can be referred to as mud crab, are uh, are referring to crab from the genus Kala. There are large fauna that can be found in mud flat of littoral zone until the intertidal zone of mangrove uh, forest throughout the Indo-Pacific region. There are commercially important crustaceans in the regions, including Malaysia. There are four species of Scala mangrove crab that can be easily identified based on their morphological appearance. The first species is Scala serrata, second is um, Scala truncibarica, Scala olivacea, and Scala parmomusen. So as seen in this picture, these can be easily identified based on the color of their chili bait. Um, as we see an example in the Scala serrata, the crow of this species uh, uh, appear in greenish color and they have a uh, highly uh, polygonal patterns on the chili bait. On the other hand, 
uh, scala truncibarica have a book, then the scala olivacea have a reddish uh, color um, uh, crow, while scala greenish color of crow, uh, however, without the clear pollen uh, nogal uh, pattern. Beside the uh, colors of the crow, some other characteristics, uh, such as the frontal lobe spine, uh, the spine on the chalipate, and can also be used as the uh, identification identifications, um, uh, feature to, to identify, to differentiate the four species. So among these four species of mud crab, Scala olivacea, uh, it's, uh, can attain a maximum size of 20 to 30 centimeter in carapace, two to three kilogram, uh, body weight. While Scala truncibarica, uh, slightly smaller at 20 centimeter in carapace width, about one to 1.5 to two kilogram body weight. Scala olivacea and Scala pomunzen also, uh, pr also have almost a similar, um, size, um, Scala truncibarica. So this makes the Scala serrata the biggest crab among the four species and they are highly demanded in the market. All right, this crab can also be uh, easily uh, differentiated. This figure 5 here shows the male mangrove crab can be easily identified with a triangle. Figure 6 shows here the uh, mature uh, female uh, mangrove crab that can be identified by the U shape and a broadened um, uh, abdominal flap. Um, this female um, actually changed the shape of progress um, to, to maturation. So when they are younger, the abdominal flap are somehow triangle and uh, look like a, a male and then um, progressively it will change to um, interval U and V shaped, the abdomen highly pigmented and now that is mature. The common and traditional way to cage a mangrove crab is by using the battered crab traps. Uh, bait used such as fish, chicken and trail or chicken head is commonly uh, used in the cage of the mangrove crab. So these battered traps will be uh, deployed along the river mangrove river and then the fishermen will retrieve the uh, the traps uh, after certain hours so according to fishermen's timing is very important to ensure successful um, cage of the crab and usually they, are, they will deploy the, the traps uh, at low tide and then uh, retrieve it uh, when it's high tide right let's see the distributions of these uh, mangrove crabs this map shows the distributions of the four species of mangrove crab. The red dot uh, represent the Scala serrata. The blue dots um, uh, represent the Scala truncibarica. The green dots represent the Scala pamumzen. And the triangle uh, orange dot represents Scala olivacea. So as can we see, as we can see from the map, that Scala trunk, uh, Scala serrata is widely the Pacific region. Uh, from uh, from Japan to um, to the West Indian Ocean. <clears throat> While the other three species, Scala parmesan and Scala olivacea, are mostly concentrated in the Southeast Asia region. In the case of Malaysia, we have reported three species um, of the mangrove crab, Scala parmesan and Scala truncibarica. Um, you can see here that although um, we have the three species in our country, however, um, the, the species compositions of these mangrove crab are different with the different uh, locality. In our case in Sabah, as you see in this map here, that the uh, Chonkibarica, Scala Chonkibarica is the dominant uh, species, uh, followed by uh, Paramamusen and Scala Olivacea. Well, the next neighboring stage in Sarawak, um, the opposite trend was observed where uh, Scala olivacea is the dominant species. So this indicate that uh, different locality uh, would offer, um, would, would have different compositions of the mangrove crab. Why we select the mangrove crab? 
Mangrove crabs are traditionally exploited for personal consumption and income uh, sources for the coastal fishing community. Uh, however, in the 1990s, where uh, the Southeast Asia uh, stream farmers facing a disease outbreak, so some of these farmers actually shift their attention to the um, mangrove crab. So currently, mangrove crab has become one of the uh, commercial fisheries products with a high market demand and high price. Product of mangrove crab can be obtained in the form of uh, live crab, soft shell crab, frozen or canned meat. One of the biggest uh, demand is the big size crab that have a uh, high that fetch high price. Taking an example in our neighbor country in Singapore, where in a premium restaurant serving of um, the um, big size crab can cost about 80 per kg. Besides, soft shell crab is also a highly uh, demanded uh, seafood. In our local restaurant in Malaysia, a serving of these uh, soft shell crab uh, can easily cost 24 to 37 USD per kg. While in international markets, the uh, soft shell crab can easily go up to 8 to 10 USD uh, per unit. Source of mangrove crab. There are two sources of mangrove crab where uh, to su supply to the in the, to the market. Uh, one is from captures um, fisheries. The other one is from aquaculture. First, look at let's look at the uh, a global top producer of uh, captures mangrove crab. The first one uh, top producer is uh, Indonesia, followed by Philippines, then Thailand. Fourth one is Singapore, and the fifth one is Thailand, Taiwan. From these producer, the capture fisheries of mangrove crabs in 2011 had contributed about 44 and, and 500,000 tons of uh, mangrove crabs, increased by 7% uh, to 48,000 uh, tons in 2018. These wild caught crab are either sold as the live crab in the market or they are used for uh, capture based aquaculture productions, for fattening processes and for the soft shell crab productions. However, recent year um, we have a report from various sources um, saying that the crab populations are suffering from overpopulations and the environmental impact associated with the human activities such as the cut down of the mangrove tree that destroyed their habitat. Aquaculture hatchery productions of mangrove crab seed was initiated in several countries in Southeast Asia since the 1990s. Currently, the top uh, producer of aquaculture mangrove crabs are Vietnam, Philippines, uh, Indonesia and Philippines. From these producer, aquaculture productions of mangrove crabs in 2011 uh, was about 36,000 ton, increased by 60% to 58,000 tons in 2018. Uh, however, these hatchery productions are still considered low and uh, inconsistent. This is um, mainly due to the uh, low survival rate of the larvae, ranging from 2 to 10% in most of the hatchery. So with the decline landing trends of the capture fisheries uh, and the market uh, rely totally, almost totally on the wild caught crabs for the capture bass uh, aquaculture and soft shell crab productions, Aquaculture seeding production of mangrove crab is one of the solutions to elevate the fishing pressure and uh, to supply enough uh, seed for the grow-up activity of the mangrove crab. However, at present, aquaculture productions of the mangrove crab are still at its uh, infancy stage. They are still facing with some uh, constraint and challenges that require more uh, research. This is a general flow of the uh, hatchery productions. So it starts with the hatchery management of the broodstock and the larvae, then goes to the nursery and the grow out stage. So in these presentations, I would like to share with you some of the uh, constraints and challenges 
uh, that we are facing in the bruce talk and larvae management of mangrove crab. Before that, I'd like to share with you the life cycles of the mangrove crab. Mangrove crabs grow out in the um, mangrove forest. So once they're mature and mate, the uh, mature female will migrate to the open sea for spawning. The larvae will hatch out in the open sea uh, from Zoya 1 to Zoya 5, then um, metamorphosis into Megalopa, and then to Crab Insta. When they are in Megalopa, they are start to have this um, benthic behavior, so they will go to more shallow water, to the coastal water. Then once they turn into crab insta, they will uh, slowly um, migrate back to the forest for grow out. Source of um, brewstock, where do we get them? So most of these uh, brewstock are obtained from the wild either as a mature female or buried female. This figure 13 here shows um, a buried female. And the size at the maturities of the crab are actually uh, important information at the size actually varies uh, among the species. So selections of the suitable size of blue stocks important for the hatchery uh, productions. This table one shows here the size of first maturity of mangrove crabs, meaning to set um, the, um, the mangrove crab that reach uh, maturations at the minimum size. This is a minimum size where they reach maturations. So based on the information here, we can see that Scala serrata actually have the bigger size uh, of uh, first maturity of the female, about uh, 12 and males about 9.4 cm carapace brief. And among these, the uh, Scala olivacea are reported to have the smaller size uh, of crab that reach um, uh, first maturity, while uh, Scala truncibarica and Scala palmusen uh, reach um, first maturity at almost the same size for both female and male at about 9 uh, cm carapace brief. Besides, uh, the wild brewstock um, are not consistent or they are varied with uh, season. Take an example in Malaysia, uh, mangrove crab actually spawn uh, year round. However, they are peak season where we can get a lot of buried female. And our study found that this buried female uh, or mature female can uh, mostly found in February, around February and in May. Or other months of the year uh, actually have a lower percentage of the mature female. Uh, besides, uh, disease outbreaks such as bacterial and fungal infections are major threat in mangrove crab aquaculture. Pathogenic uh, marine fungus infections such as Legionidium um, and uh, Helitrotrus were reported to cause mass prop mortality of the eggs and larvae of uh, Scala truncibarica in our hatchery. This figure 15 shows here the eggs that are heavily infected by the uh, fungus. Although we can see that the larvae are still developing um, in the sac, however, all these larvae will um, um, reach 100% mortality within five to three to five days after post hatching. Besides the uh, uh, um, Problems with the uh, bacteria and fungus infections, protozoa infections were also commonly detected uh, in the uh, mangrove crab uh, brewstock management. Um, to overcome, to reduce these uh, of these uh, disease infections, currently um, brewstock are given formalin bath, uh, although not recommended, to use to reduce the occurrence of the disease outbreak in the hatchery. So this figure shows here the healthy eggs of the uh, truncibarica. Now, besides the uh, bacterial or fungal infections, uh, the brewstock also facing another problem of uh, barnacle infections. Parasitic barnacle uh, saccharinic infections uh, can cause actually uh, huge uh, economic losses. Um, this um, uh, parasitic barnacle saclina is reported to affect about 50% both female and male population of Scala olivacea in Sabah. 
Uh, however, we have uh, not found the infections of these um, parasitic uh, barnacles in uh, Trunchy barica, Scala trunchy barica, and Scala parmosaic. This infection can and uh, can cause uh, sterility of the crabs and actually alter the test of the infected uh, crabs. Means that the um, female or male will not be able to reproduce once they are uh, affected by this um, Banica sacolini. Besides the uh, wild crab, uh, rootstock can be sourced from adult that produced in the hatchery. For mangrove crab, cross-cycle productions can be done in the hatchery and that allow more control of the rootstock quality. So to induce the rootstock maturation in captivity, culture conditions is very critical. For culture conditions, um, design of the shape, shape of the tank, types of the system, um, they are varied uh, among the hatchery. And currently, most of the hatchery, crab hatchery uh, in, in Southeast Asia is uh, based on a design of a shrimp hatchery. So for the spawning of the female of mangrove crab, um, sand, Condition of the tank, tank must be uh, equipped with a sand substrate. Besides, uh, good water quality are important to produce the disparate female in captivity. Through a few years of trial and research, uh, we have developed a, a tank system, a maturation tank system for the mangrove craft. Uh, we call the, the maturation tank as eco-friendly title tank. This system is a program to mimic an almost a natural habitat for the crabs with uh, uh, high and low tide conditions uh, and provide good water and substrate quality. Uh, the tank is constructed with also uh, different zones for feeding and resting of the crabs. It's not only convenient for the uh, easy feeding management, uh, routine management, but it's also helped to reduce the deterioration of the water quality. As seen in the figure 18 here, it's the conditions where the tank are filled with water, while in the figure 19 shows the uh, tank system uh, with very minimum of water that creates low tide conditions for the uh, mangrove crab. So with this uh, tank system, it provides a clean sand substrate for the uh, borrowing and spawning activities of the crabs. For spawning of the crabs, sand um, must be present and it must be clean to avoid uh, or to reduce the uh, occurrence of disease. So by using this uh, system for nearly three years now, we can produce the barrett female naturally in the tank without the use of hormone or even ice ablations. And with this uh, tank also, we um, monitored that the uh, mortality of the crab, uh, af especially after molting, was reduced as the soft-shell crab can uh, escape from being attacked by other crab by boring themselves in the sand, as you can see in the figure 21. Besides the tank system, uh, maturation diet is another important factor to ensure the boost of um, reproductive performance and larvae quality. Table 2 here shows the natural feed that tested at maturation for uh, Scala species. So the commonly used uh, natural feed are trust feed, squid, mussels, um, and snail and black cocker. So this study found that uh, the natural feed actually provides some beneficial effect to the bushstock, such as uh, shorten the ovarian uh, maturation period from molting to spawning, larger eggs diameter, shorter latency periods between the ice to ablation to spawning and improve the chance of second spawning in the mangrove crab. However, the use of natural feed may increase the risk of disease transmission while the quality and quantity of this uh, natural feed differ uh, seasonally. So, uh, formulated diet uh, become an alternative to replace the natural feed as maturation diet for Christian Rustock. Uh, formulated diets uh, offer an advantages uh, of allowing the customizations of the nutritional profile that meet the natural that meet the maturation requirements of the Rustock. 
It is a common trend to fortify the quality of the feed with feed additive currently in aquaculture. So feed additive actually provide extra value on the uh, key nutrients that play a specific role in enhancing the reproductive performance of the crustacean. So this table three shows the comparison of the uh, uh, the use of natural and uh, formulated feed in uh, Scala serrata. This study shows that the performance of the crab uh, were not um, consistent with the natural feed and the uh, formulated feed and all the combinations of both of natural feed and the um, formulated feed. Um, although some study has done on the maturation, developing a maturation diet for mostly for Scala serrata, um, in Trunky Barica, which is a dominant species in Sabah, there's a limited information uh, to develop the uh, rootstock diet. Although there are four species of mangrove crab that can be found associated with each other, they show different preferences of habitats and salinity, and especially uh, Scala serrata that cannot be found in the mangrove, uh, mangrove forest in Malaysia, whereas the next neighboring country, Philippines, are abundant with Scala serrata. So in our hatchery, a study was conducted to evaluate the reproductive performance of Scala serrata using formula diet that supplements with feed additive, um, the fatty acid, uh, DHA and exanthin. So in this experiment, we formulated four diet. Um, FA is diet with exanthin. FD is diet formulated diet with uh, DHA. FA plus D is a formulated diet uh, with uh, exanthin and uh, DHA. While we have a control diet that uh, with a formulated diet without any of these additives. Uh, in this in the experiment, we also included a natural a feed of a uh, trust feed, stream, and uh, mangrove clam as the control diet. Let us look at some of the results that we obtained in uh, the study. So our study shows that the formulated diet, uh, if uh, with azazantin and DHA, shows the highest uh, performance in terms of maturation rate and spawning rate uh, compared to uh, the broodstock that fed with uh, control diet, uh, formulated diet without any um, additive, without any azacentin or DHA. The performance of the broodstock that fed with the natural diet, on the other hand, uh, are also lower than the uh, broodstock that fed with uh, formulated diet with azacentin and DHA. However, uh, the uh, broodstock that fed with uh, the natural feed actually um, shorten the period for the broodstock to reach a uh, spawning stage from a uh, um, pre-mortal um, mode. So uh, while the uh, broodstock that fed with the um, formula that year actually require a longer time between molting and sp spawning. Uh, this figure 22 shows the gometal somatin index of the trunky barica that fed with these different types of uh, maturation diet. We can see here the diet that fed with uh, azazantine, uh, the broodstock that fed with azazantine with the um, uh, DHA and especially DHA and, and azazantine actually show a uh, higher, significant higher gonad somatic index compared to the control without the additive and the um, a natural feed. This figure 23 shows the color and uh, fullness of the gonad. Uh, female gonad that fed with the experimental diet. You can see here that uh, female crabs that fed with a diet that supplement with azazantin or azazantin with DHA or uh, with uh, DHA uh, actually improve the um, uh, gonad somatic index and fullness of the, the gonad will compare to the uh, rootstock that fed with a diet without the additive or the uh, diet uh, fed with the natural feed. So this uh, clearly indicate that full um, formulated feed supplement with um, feed additive, in this case the azazantin and DHA, can enhance the reproductive of the broodstock in captivity and their performance are 
uh, better than the uh, natural feed. So based on our experience, uh, culturing the uh, brewstock in the uh, title tanks and with the use of the formulated feed, um, we can produce uh, year-round productions of ferret female and reduce the um, occurrence of the disease uh, infections in the hatchery. Besides improvement on the female reproductive performance, the study also shows that the sperm viability of the male mangrove crab was also improved in the treatments that fed with a formulated diet um, and supplemented with exoxanthine uh, DHA and uh, exoxanthine and DHA. And um, the same trends also observe uh, on the uh, larvae quality as the higher trends of uh, survival can be observed in the Zoya 2 larvae in the, um, in the broodstock that actually fed with the um, formulated diet with azazentin, uh, with DHA and uh, combination both of uh, azazentin and DHA. Now let us look at the lava railing, particularly on the diet for the larvae. Besides the mass mortality that caused by the disease infections, study by Hamazaki shows that nutritional content of the feed significantly influence the survival and success of seed productions in mangrove crabs, Scala serrata. The study shows that dial tree entry, highly unsaturated fatty acid entry hufa provided by the freshwater cholera affected the larva morphogenesis and metamorphosis to megalops in um, Scala serrata. The study found that feeding the larvae with live feed supplemented with cholera content and trihufa accelerates the larvae morphogenesis, where the fifth stage zoya shows morphological features similar to those of the next stage megalopa larvae. Another trial, Hamazaki uh, used um, high concentrations of another marine microalgae narrocoropsis in the railing of Scala serrata. Also shows that uh, feeding the larvae with these uh, micro uh, algae also cause mass mortality during the metamorphosis from the Zoya 5 to um, megalopod stage. This abnormally advanced um, morphological feature termed as hypomorphogenesis. Caused the fifth stage Zoya larvae fell to metamorphosis to the next stage. They have classified this abnormality into three types as shown in this figure 26. Study by Hamazaki shows that the Zoya metamorphogenesis is accelerated by the nutritional conditions of the Zoya due to the supplementary effects of the narcopsis, which contain. A high um, amount of eicosapentanoic acid (EPA), which is an essential fatty acid for the um, larvae. This indicates that the balance of concentrations of fatty acid is important to ensure higher larvae survival. Uh, generally, each types of microalgae contain different uh, profiles of fatty acid. Some uh, microalgae are rich in um, Hufa, particularly EPA, and some are rich in uh, docosahexanoic acid, DHA. In an ongoing trial in our hatchery, we introduce another different types of uh, microalgae species as feed for the uh, live feed, uh, such as rotifer and artemia, before feeding them to the uh, larvae. The microalgae tested in this trial is uh, nanocoropsis and tetrasamis. As shown in the study by Hamazaki, nanocoropsis uh, contain high number of EPA, which is an essential fatty acid for the um, larvae development. However, the study also shows that too high amount of this uh, fatty acid accelerate the um, larvae development too fast and lead to the mass mortality. In tropical regions such as in Malaysia, uh, nanocoropsis is easily collapsed. And on the other hand, the culture of tetrasamis is relatively stable compared to nanocoropsis. So in this trial, we also testing on the uh, use of live microalgae and digestible microalgae and feed it to the uh, live feed. 
Digestible microalgae is referring to a microalgae that has been subjected to treatment to break down the cell wall of the microalgae. These digestible uh, microcal algae can also be kept for longer periods under refrigerated conditions compared to the live microalgae. So in this study, we are testing on the use of the live and digestible microalgae of uh, nanocoropsis and tetrasomies on the lava railing of Stella uh, truncibarica. In this diet, a comparison also met on the uh, commercial product and uh, Rotifer live feed without um, enrichment will also use as a control. So here are some of the results they were obtained from uh, the trial. As we can see here that the um, rotifer that uh, supplemented with the live or digestible uh, nanocoropsis shows higher EPA content than compared to the rest of the treatment. Um, in the group that fed with uh, that enriched with um, live tetra or the, uh, digestible tetra, the um, content of EPA is almost half of that from the uh, nanocoropsis. Well, on the other hand, the uh, DHA content of the microalgae uh, from both of these uh, species are almost similar at about uh, ranging from 0 0.8 to 1%. Uh, well, on the other hand, the uh, high, very high uh, DHA content was uh, observed in the uh, commercial product. Well, let's let us look at the uh, some of the data on the uh, survival and the larval stage index of the mangrove crabs Scala truncibarica of Zoya 1 to Zoya 2 that fed with these different types of microalgae. So in the early stage of the uh, larvae developments, we can see that uh, uh, larvae that fed with rotifer and rich with the live microalgae or the uh, live nanocropsis or digestible nanocropsis shows higher trend of uh, survival rate than compared to the, the rest of the um, treatment. Um, the higher, slightly higher uh, larvae stage index also observed in this uh, group of uh, uh, treatment. While uh, a lower survival rate were observed in the group uh, that fed with fortifer that are not enriched. Table 8 shows here the survival and larvae stage index of the um, Scala truncibarica larvae, Zoya 3 to Megalopa, fed with these different types of microalgae. As we can see in this uh, figure here that the um, my, that Zoya fed with um, Artemia that enriched with uh, either live or tetrasamase actually shows higher survival rate. And uh, we also observe that um, uh, larvae that fed with the digestible uh, the nanocoropsis or tetrasamis shows higher survival than compared to the live uh, microalgae. Uh, this study is still ongoing, so the uh, abnormal mortality, uh, morphological conditions of the larvae uh, cannot be shared in this presentation. So and, uh, we can see that the inconsistent and low productions of uh, mangrove crab uh, seedling from the hatchery is one of the major constraints that limit the aquaculture expansions of mangrove crab. We have so far improved the broodstock performance of both female and male and the lava quality with the use of feed additives such as um, DHA and azantine. That the clear sand substrate and good of the important condition that must be fulfilled in order to set up the maturation tank for broodstock. So in this, we actually uh, set up, um, design a um, uh, tidal tank, a semi tidal tank, the broodstock. So our preliminary observations also shows that the microalgae uh, tetrasamis has a potential improve the uh, survival of the larvae, especially during the uh, metamorphosis from the Zoya 5 to Megalopa stage. However, more research are still needed to improve the reproductive performance of broodstock, survival and growth of the various stages of the larvae and juvenile. Among these, the use of a natural or organic solution is definitely needed 
to replace the use of formalin in the uh, brew stock management. Uh, the use of organic uh, or natural solution is also needed uh, to replace the use of antibiotics and antifungal uh, in the lava railing. Some of the um, hatchery in Southeast Asia has reported the use of the, these um, chemicals in their lava railing. Besides that, the debris stock that uh, developments of, um, could be um, established to improve the brew stock quality. Besides uh, solutions to improve the survival of crab insta and also uh, important. At, um, currently, our hatcheries are focusing on the, uh, imp on the solutions to improve the survival of the crab insta and in juvenile at the um, nursery stage. Before I end my uh, presentation today, I get it, uh, uh, mangrove crab uh, team member for the excellent work and support um, uh, these years and my appreciations of Spander who have supported our uh, study on the mangrove crab. Uh, with that, I thank you for your um, time and attention. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Anita, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, uh, I, we have some questions from the audience and I'll um, just check them and uh, I will make them in Portuguese first and I translate them to you, okay? Okay. Okay, first one is, uh, foram as principais dificuldades né, encontradas para obter satisfatoriamente as larvas de, dos caranguejos, ok? Uh, which were the main constraints you have uh, faced until being able to successfully obtain crab seedlings based on your experience with the sea lice species? Excuse me, can I have the question again? Uh, which were the main constraints you have faced before you could obtain the crab seedlings of the sila species you cultivate in Malaysia? All right. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. But what were the first uh, the first constraint that we're actually facing uh, during our early stage of uh, culturing was actually the disease problem. Uh, fungus, uh, fungus infection are actually are uh, very common uh, in in the early stage uh, when we didn't actually set up the the, the proper condition for the brew stock. But progressively, when we improve on the uh, fungus infections, then uh, we, we we then we found that the the feed is actually another important uh, issue. So that's why we are using different types of phytoplankton to feed to the uh, roti fur, the live feed actually to see to uh, to okay. see you know now we can improve the uh, larvae quality. Ok, thank you. I'll translate it. Thank you. É, ela comentou que a principal dificuldade foi relacionada à infestação de doenças, de fungos, né, parasitas, é, e que, na sequência, o segundo problema maior, a segunda dificuldade, seria relacionada à nutrição, né, que foram, de certa forma, contornados com o uso de é, alimentação com plâncton. Tá? Com relação ainda a tratamentos feitos é, para reduzir a mortalidade, né, Eu vou perguntar a ela se o tratamento feito com formalina nos reprodutores foram significativos para reduzir a mortalidade de por fungos e bactéria. Okay? Um, the next question, uh, Dr. Anita, is whether the use of formalin was efficient in reducing significantly the mortality of larvae caused by bacteria and fungi. And if you would recommend it or not, in spite of the, the constraints that we, we know about. All right. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, formalin actually is not recommended uh, in, in uh, most of the country, even in Malaysia, we are actually not recommending the use of formalin. Um, it is actually helped to prevent the uh, fungus infection, actually. So uh, we, we try actually, uh, when we treat the, the brew stock with the formalin, it's actually reduced the occurrence of the uh, fungus disease infection. Um, 
when but when when the larvae or the broodstock are infected by the fungus, uh, the formalin actually will not help to reduce the mortality, but it's actually help to uh, doing uh, uh, prevention actually, more to reduce the uh, occurrence. Okay. Bom, ela comentou que o uso da formalina seria muito mais preventivo, né, e que uma vez infectado ela não é satisfatório né, para, para o controle das, da, das uh, infestações por larvas e, e fungos, ok? Uh, uma outra questão é, quais seriam os estágios larvais com maior mortalidade? The next uh, question is, which are the larva stages that are more uh, due to mortality? In which stage mortality was higher? during the larval development. All right, thank you for the questions. Um, in, 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 the, uh, in our experience, uh, when the larvae reach to Zoya 4, when they need to metamorphosis, um, more to met, uh, Zoya 5, and then metamorphosis into the next stage, Megalopa. So actually the mass mortality occurred uh, when the Zoya uh, trying to metamorphosis into uh, Megalopa. So that is the actually, the mass mortality, one of the mass mortality that occurred. If it's not because of by the fungus, and then the most fertility uh, due to metamorphosis. Bom, ela responde que o período de maior mortalidade é a fase final da passagem de zoea para megalópolis, né? quando ocorre a formação é, do, do megalópolis nos estágios finais de zoea. Ok, let me see, uh, we have some other questions here. Há uma pergunta se foi avaliada a qualidade dos reprodutores ao longo do tempo e quanto tempo os reprodutores passam na produção. Ok. Um, another question people are concerned about is if you evaluate the quality of the brood stock uh, along, along the time and how long do the, brood, the brooders uh, stay in the production uh, plant? How long do you right. use? In, in, in our hatchery, um, um, we actually keep the brew stock for a few months. Um, uh, once we get the uh, the mature brew stock in captivity, so uh, that, that we will keep them for a few months, uh, at least at least six months to eight months to, to uh, uh, reproductions in, in captivity. Mm -hmm. So then after that, uh, that, that will be actually indicates of uh, two, two event or spawning event. Then after that, uh, we will actually renew the brew stock. We will not use the same brew stock again. Okay, so tempo approximately six months that will be utilized. And after that, it will be a substitution of the reproductors. Uh, I don't know if we still have time for another question. Okay. É, a pergunta é se seria interessante trabalhar com reprodutores livres de patógenos ou resistentes a patógenos, se tem alguma linha de pesquisa é, nessa área no laboratório. Dr. Anita, another question is, uh, if you think if it, is, uh, it would be interesting to work with uh, pathogen-free breeders or pathogen-resistant breeders, if it is possible, and if you have uh, in your lab or within your group any research line uh, dealing with this. Sorry, you're, you're referring to the uh, uh, specific pathogen free brew stock, is it? Yes. All right. Uh, we, we have not actually started uh, that, that work, but um, um, that, that could be a future work. We have not done anything yet on that, Prof, again, Prof. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. So it's a promising area. Huh? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Bom, ela disse que até o momento não tem ninguém é, trabalhando com isso, mas que seria uma área promissora para futuras pesquisas com 
na obtenção de uh, organismos reprodutores livres de patógenos. Eu acho que nós temos uma última pergunta aqui. Deixa eu ver. Ok, I think we have the last, uh, last question here. All right. Uh, uh, oh, I would like to know uh, which are the perspectives of using commercial feed for larvae culture, considering the nutritional uh, restrictions, huh? and how uh, how could that be achieved within the near future? Do you think it will be possible to succeed in obtaining larvae survival using commercial feeding? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Excuse me, that's just for a Perguntei a ela se ela considera que será possível no futuro próximo o uh, uso de alimentação artificial para obtenção de larvas. Ok, now please, uh, Dr. Anita, can I ask, please? All right, thank you. Um, feeding, commercial feeding, well, that uh, we have actually quite lots of our commercial feeding market, but as our result shows, um, um, beside our result that done by uh, Hamazaki actually shows that the the DHA, the HUFA, actually very important. The balance of these two are actually very important. The, the DHA actually needed uh, in the early stage of the larvae development. However, uh, towards the uh, Zoya 5, 4, 5, and uh, 4 and 5, that actually we can see that too much of these are not good for the larvae because they can, they can form a malformation. They are too big, so they cannot metamorphose. So I think we still need to... Um, uh, find a balance between uh, using uh, these commercial feed uh, or by using the live uh, phytoplankton actually to actually adjust the requirements of this, this larvae. I, I do think that it, it can be achieved. Uh, our, our preliminary result actually shows that uh, the tetrasomies that we actually used in our presentation just now actually uh, shows the lower trends of uh, uh, mortality that caused by the abnormal uh, morphology. So I think uh, there are still Commercial still can be used, commercial feeding still can be used. It's just that we need to adjust the, the feeding. I think that's uh, something we need to do in the future. Right. Bom, em resumo, o que ela comentou é que é, é possível isso, mas há ainda muito é, problema com a má formação né, em alguns estágios, sobretudo entre o EA4 e 5, em função do desbalanço em ácidos graxos. E que se, fosse, se for possível é, ajustar isso, balancear isso no alimento, seria possível utilizar uma ração é, artificial, enfim, um alimento artificial. Mas, sem dúvida alguma, o uso da alimentação natural ainda é o que tem dado os melhores resultados na sobrevivência das larvas. Ok? Uh, ok, so, uh, we are uh, over time, so we have to stop here, unfortunately. If there are any other questions, ok, we may say them to you or anyone who is interested in asking you any further question may contact you through your sure. by your email okay thank you again sure, dr sure, anita for your sure. presence here it was it was very yeah, nice thank you pro cooperation okay. thank you pro uh, bye bye then bye okay pessoal então quem tiver mais informações perguntas a fazer pode utilizar o e-mail da doutora anita e dirigir suas perguntas diretamente a ela obrigado Com muita desde 1983 e agradeço imensamente ter podido conhecer esse curso, né? E a história é um pouco engraçada. Em 1977 eu fui a Recife e estava jogando bola na praia e vi um, um rapaz de cabelo de cabeça realmente raspado. Eu perguntei, ó. Oh, mas por que você está de cabeça raspada? Ele falou que eu passei em engenharia de pesca. Morava no Rio de Janeiro né? e já gostava de pescar e, e da atividade pesqueira como um todo. Ia muito para a Praça 15 para ver lá os barcos de pesca. Né? E aí eu fui lá no departamento de engenharia de pesca, conheci o departamento. Não é o que é hoje, mas mudou muito, graças a Deus, para melhor. E aí ingressei 
fiz vestibular e ingressei no, no curso em 1979 e me formando em 1983. Né? Tenho muito, mas muito orgulho desse engenheiro de pesca. É, de ver um pouquinho depois, fui mais para a área acadêmica e aí, e aí realmente trabalhei mais com engenharia de produção, mas nunca deixei a atividade pesqueira. Fiz alguns empreendimentos né? e sou bastante feliz. É, recomendo né, a profissão, acho ela importantíssima, fundamental para um país como o Brasil. E desde 1979, quando eu entrei na faculdade, continua sendo uma profissão de futuro, mas um futuro mais realista e que eu espero que é, os, as próximas gerações, os próximos engenheiros de pesca, que já tem realmente uma formação é, mais moderna do que a gente, porque a minha foi muito sólida. Eu agradeço imensamente a todos os meus professores, é, professor Ramente Motorrache, Coique, né, Paulo Burgos, né, tô, e tem outros que, infelizmente, é, não é que eu esteja esquecido. E são os três que realmente marcaram mais a minha vida durante o curso. Então eu tenho muito orgulho de ser engenheiro de pesca e agradeço a Deus todo dia e, a, e aos meus pais que me deram essa oportunidade e que realmente acreditaram em mim para que eu fizesse o curso. Tá? Muito obrigado. E esses 50 anos, eles são assim, muito para mim, da minha parte, muito emocionantes. Foi uma das melhores fases da minha vida quando eu né, frequentei o Departamento de Engenharia de Pesca na Universidade Rural de Pernambuco. Obrigado a todos. Bom dia mais uma vez, dando continuidade à nossa sessão da manhã. Gostaria de convidar o próximo moderador, o professor William Severi, para conduzir a palestra titulada Cultivo de Híbridos de Garupa. Professor William, por favor. Bom dia, professor, obrigado mais uma vez, dando continuidade, então, à nossa sessão é, matinal é, de hoje. Nós é, gostaríamos de apresentar a doutora Fayana Shingabduna, ela tem um bacharelado, mestrado e PhD em aquicultura, tem como área de pesquisa a produção de sementes em aquicultura e experiência na nutrição e cultivo de, de organismos aquáticos em aquicultura, também trabalhado com peixes e com alguns crustáceos. E a doutora Xing também é, faz parte da University Malaysia Sabah. Ok? Dr. Ching, I think you are present in this session. You could just show up. Hello, how are you? Hello. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to our meeting. Okay, yeah, we are going to we are, we are going to start then the, the recorded presentation. Okay, yeah. we may close, yeah. make we may uh, shut uh, down yeah, our okay. features. Okay. okay. See you later then. See you later, Prof. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fayana Ching. I'm from Borneo Marine Research Institute of University Malaysia Sabah. And today I would like to share with you a topic on hybrid grouper aquaculture. I will start with the definition. And I think this is the most uh, straightforward and also the easiest um, definition to reflect what fish hybridization is. It is actually a crossbreeding between two different species of the same genus. I give you an example here. So this is uh, Epinephalus species, and you can see a female tiger grouper, Epinephalus fuscogutatus, um, crossbreed with a male giant grouper, and also uh, Epinephalus species of Lagellatus. And in the end, we get a product of hybrid grouper, giant grouper, Epinephalus fuscogutatus with Epinephalus lanceolatus. So I think this is the most common being performed in aquaculture. Uh, around the world. We have a lot of species of hybrid grouper that have been published and also been cited in a lot of articles. So, And among all these articles, I came across with another uh, popular hybrid fish, uh, which mainly found in, in, in Brazil and also is a product of aquaculture 
um, in Brazil. So you can see here, these are the three hybrid species that are very famous in Brazil. We have a tambachu, we have a tambatinga, and also patinga. I hope I pronounce it correctly. So in aquaculture, when we have performed a fish hybridization, it actually reflects how advanced is our, our technology, our research, and our our works in aquaculture until we are able to produce a better fish means um, a better compared to the uh, to the parental fish of course in the control condition so from here it's easily understand that even in Brazil um, the advance of aquaculture in Brazil is easily understood with the production of a good hybrid species like these three species. And another example that I would like to share with you is the Sichu salmon in Japan. So in Japan, um, there have been imported a lot of salmon from uh, overseas, from Norway, from, uh, from Chile. So this country been exporting uh, a lot of salmon to, to Japan and now with the production of this hybrid Sichu salmon, Japan is no longer or already reduced uh, the import of um, salmon from those countries and they are able to actually produce it locally. So this is also another uh, another good example of uh, a benefit of fish hybridization when you are able to produce a better fish and in the same time you are able to minimize um, the, the import from the other country so that you can maximize whatever um, the resources that you have in, in your own country. So this is also um, one of the importance of fish hybridization in aquaculture. So not only in aquaculture that fish hybridization has been performed and this is also happened in the ornamental industry. This is particularly very critical since in ornamental industry people are looking for fancy and also beautiful body coloration of, um, of, of fish because most of the ornamental fish are meant to be kept, right? So they need something very colorful, they need something, you know, that looks nice. So a lot of hybridization have been uh, performed in ornamental industry because they want to choose the best um, desired uh, traits or the, the, the desired characteristic or external morphology in particularly on um, to be marketed in in ornamental industry so fish hybridization is not only common in aquaculture but also in ornamental industry and how it happened how can we do a fish hybridization so basically fish hybridization it can happen um, naturally because sometimes uh, a different species of, um, of fish either from the same genus or a little bit far from the genus when they when they are found in the same habitat and they spawn almost uh, in the same time. So the incidence of um, fish hybridization in a natural way will happen. And there are also a few articles that can be found, um, a, a good articles on how some fish are, are recorded um, um, have been hybridized in the, in the natural ecosystem. But in aquaculture, most of the fish hybridization is actually through artificial induced um, works. So meaning to say we are choosing, um, we are choosing or selecting uh, the parental fish and then uh, we crossbreed it. So this one is the artificial induced um, hybridization. This is the most common, especially in aquaculture because we have the broodstock. We know how to choose which male or which female we, we we did the selection so most of the hybridization in aquaculture is not in the natural way but through the artificial induced hybridization so in aquaculture fish hybridization is considered a very important and very powerful tools because we are benefit a lot from the fish hybridization which include um, a, a, a new fish that of course uh, with a better growth rate they are able to improve the overall productivity because of the hybrid vigor all this desired threat all this better uh, characteristic compared to the parental fish and sometimes we purposely do a fish hybridization because we actually looking for certain desired threats in the in the in the new hybrid fish and sometimes we do hybridization just because we want to have a good flesh quality i will show you some of the examples some of the of the very successful um, 
topics or successful stories on the fish hybridization of each of these benefits and of course the most important um, um, contributions of fish hybridization works is um, to have a fish that have a disease resistant because we know when disease happen it can kill um, I think I can kill even 100% of the fish so we want a fish with a high resistance to a certain disease so that because in aquaculture it's about profit in aquaculture it's all about uh, dollar and cents so we want to reduce or we want to minimize a disease to be occurred we want to maximize the profit so with the production of fish hybridization when they have a good um, um, fish with resistant to disease this is a good uh, this is a um, this is a like what uh, like like a bonus in aquaculture and of course we want to have um, a fish that can tolerate a wide range of um, of environmental changes and food conversion ratio I will show I will show some of the example with all of you but to bear in mind fish hybridization in aquaculture it should be conducted in the captivity with a strong uh, with a, a very tight biosecurity which I will focus um, I will share with all of you in the later slide so I will share with you when this is the example of um, when fish um, have better growth than the parental fish you can see here the pure tiger grouper and also the hybrid tiger grouper in um, in Asia region where the temperature is quite high all year round is quite constant um, we are of course able to produce a grouper all year round because of our temperature here are quite constant and a bit warm and also higher compared to a four season country so pure grouper actually they, they takes about um, three years I think about two two and three years I think it's a average in three years to grow into marketable size but for hybrid grouper it, it is easily to reach about 700 gram or 800 gram within a seven to eight months so you can see how many cycle of hybrid grouper that we can produce in order to produce one batch of tiger grouper so from here tiger grouper takes about three years and hybrid grouper more or less or one year we have three cycles of of, of production of hybrid grouper to be to, to meet the, the, the market demand to, for the human population for the consumption of human population so with this we can see a better growth um, is easily attained with the hybrid tiger grouper so this is one of the one of the, the biggest discovery in in aquaculture when you have a better or you have a fast growth uh, fish compared to the parental fish and of course when you have a better growth rate of hybrid fish it will actually improve the the productivity right so another example of a, a hybrid um, tilapia here this study was conducted in Saudi Arabia you can see that um, this is a very good article they compare actually different species of um, tilapia a red tilapia a hybrid tilapia and also a pure tilapia you can see here the results the finding uh, reveal that the hybrid grouper to be the best candidate for intensive tank culture so because they are able to have a higher higher survival rate they have a better um, body weight better growth performance in overall so this is what we are looking for in aquaculture we want to have a better growth rate and also to improve the productivity and another example here um, this is also to compare a pure grouper and uh, no no a pure catfish and also a hybrid catfish you can see here even a hybrid catfish they offer a better uh, performance advantages for the overall US um, catfish in the United States so with a rapid growth and also easy um, in terms of the spawning and it are able they are able to tolerate a wide range of temperature so all these are a best quality a best fish that a best candidate because not even the hybrid group uh, hybrid fish when we are talking about selecting a good candidate of fish to be to be an aquaculture fish we always looking for those fish that able to grow fast right that able to tolerate a wide range of temperature so these are the characteristic in selecting aquaculture fish in selecting the candidate to be um, to be to be included in aquaculture so when this hybrid um, catfish in this particular case are able to to show all these good characteristics so this is 
what um, the articles meant. They offer a performance advantages for uh, the whole United States in terms of the catfish production. And apart from um, a good crop, the hybrid, uh, hybrid fish also um, able to transfer some of the desirable uh, or some of the desired traits. So um, here I would like to share with you uh, another example of the hybrid salmon where the uh, parental of Atlantic salmon crossbreed with the brown uh, trout. You can see here again the hybrid grouper are uh, no, 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 this I'm sorry the hybrid fish of um, between these two parental fish are able to show a better group performance and sometimes similar to uh, Atlantic salmon because Atlantic salmon they grow fast compared to the brown trout. So in order to have um, to have a similar or even better growth um, growth uh, red or fish, ecoculture sometimes purposely choose Atlantic salmon as a parental has a has a broodstock so that the this kind of threat or this kind of genetics will be passed through uh, the, the the hybrid fish so that the hybrid the new hybrid fish will inherit this particular gene that. Uh, where the fish are able to grow even more faster or similarly with the parental fish. And then next, I would like to share you, with you also another example of how fish hybridization are able to contribute a good flesh quality. You can see here again this salmon. A very, very good article. So I have went through this one again and again. I was amazed on how a comparison between a farm and also a wild and hybrid Atlantic salmon uh, was made by uh, this group of excellent um, researchers. So we can see here the flesh quality is only slightly different, but when they did uh, a, a consume acceptance test, there seems like there is no significant difference in terms of the flesh quality. So this is what we want. Not only the fish are able to grow fast, but the test is also acceptable by the consumer. So this kind of, um, of benefit is what we want to see when we're performing the fish hybridization. Because sometimes when we only have um, a fast crop fish, it doesn't mean that the, the, the consumer will be able to accept it because the test might be different. But in this particular case, they have done a very good comparison study. They can see that the flash quality is only slightly uh, different, but the acceptance level is there among the consumer. Okay, another good thing about fish hybridization is the disease resistant. So you can see here, this is in the case of um, a rainbow trout, uh, three species of char and also rainbow trout and also the hybrid. And only the hybrid show a high uh, resistance uh, to the salmonid viruses. We know that in aquaculture, uh, a disease caused by a viruses have been have been a major enemy to aquaculture. It can kill our fish instantly. So um, mass mortality have been reported in a lot of articles, in a lot of papers. So when you have this kind of a new fish. Uh, of course, produced in under a very uh, a very tight biosecurity in the captivity, this kind of fish we are always looking for because they have a high resistance to the, what's the disease, so that you have a higher survival or higher production rate of that particular fish. And another example of um, the good thing about fish hybridization is when you have a hybrid fish that able to tolerate um, a wide range of, um, of of environmental changes. We know that fish are very sensitive to environment when the dissolved oxygen or the temperature or the pH is slightly drop or increased in the water uh, environment or in your tank, it will actually um, affect the well-being of the fish. Sometimes they are unable to, to, to adapt with, um, with a sudden drop of salinity or a sudden drop of dissolved oxygen, but with a hybrid fish that have um, a wide tolerance of environment, this will give uh, aquaculture industry more relief in terms of looking after the fish, right? So because they um, now the hybrid fish are able to tolerate the, the wide range of environmental changes, so they are more hardy compared to a slightly um, sensitive fish. So this is also uh, some of the good um, examples or some of the good characteristics in aquaculture. Okay, I would like to show you another good example before I go for a group hybridization, okay? So you can see here fish hybridization, 
in aquaculture, we always looking for a food conversion ratio because this is uh, the most important part because it involves dollar and cent. It involves a lot of calculation. So we want to have a lower FCR so that we can maximize profit. So again, this article um, showing that the hybrid catfish they have a slightly low or even very low um, FCR compared to the pure species so perhaps it's because of the growth perhaps it's because of the feeding performance of the fish so um, if you're interested with this um, study you can uh, you can check on these articles on by these excellent uh, researchers so i have shared with you some of the good things about um, fish hybridization in general so now i would like to share with you specifically on group hybridization so in this photo you can see this is my student holding uh, a hybrid grouper this is um i i took this photo last week i just want to show you how beautiful is this hybrid grouper because this hybrid grouper is now is already um dominating the seafood industry in asian uh, region in particular if you have uh, if you have chance to visit asia when you have uh, a chance to go to this um restaurant most of the fish is actually dominated by um hybrid grouper um, similarly what you have seen in this photo okay just the introduction of grouper i think in brazil you also have uh, a grouper i will share with you later on so grouper are found normally in the rocky and coral reefs uh, of the tropics and also subtropics around the world and it will give uh, a benefit to those country without a fall seasons because you can produce grouper uh, all year round and unfortunately because of the good flesh quality because of the good ornamental uh, no, organoleptic qualities of um, grouper they are always been targeted uh, for for fishing for over exploitation for to meet the market demand because of the good quality of the flesh and it is not surprised to see even some of the grouper is now already been endangered is listed as endangered species or nearly threatened species because um, they are very important in seafood industry and also very important um, to support uh, a local economy so but yeah grouper is now actually a very vulnerable uh, species so in aquaculture it is always uh, good to produce those fish that nearly threaten or also endangered species and in brazil i think you have um these two groupers uh dusky grouper and also um another one I, I forget another one species but these are the most common species that can be found along the coastal uh, area in 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 brazil so when i went through some of the articles about grouper in brazil i know um, most of the papers are talking about dusky dusky uh, grouper so i know this is a very common for all of you in brazil um, so again, because of the excellent organoleptic qualities, it has been a demand from the seafood industry. So without any doubts that the um, grouper are subjected to overfishing, overexploitation in natural stock. So I remember when I asked my student go to the fish market every year without fail, I will bring my student to fish market. So I have about uh, 15 years data on uh, on on grouper in the fish market the size is getting smaller uh, year by year and of course the number of uh, of groupers is also getting less so this is one of the indicators um, that um, grouper are actually over uh, uh, over exploited and also overfishing so more action from the group aquaculture should be taken so that we can we can you know we can produce a lot of grouper in captivity so that people will not um, go out to the sea more often to get them to, to catch more grouper unless it is um, because sometimes even in the juvenile stage even the fish with a lot of eggs um, they just been harvested um, without any responsibility without any sense of responsible so I hope the group aquaculture will will grow we progress more aggressively so that we can re, uh, we can we, we, we can support the demand of the, 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 the industry, especially the seafood industry. So for group aquaculture, now we want to shift from the wild caught to a farm fish. This is the only option that we have. We want to stop people relying on the wild stock. So we try to produce a fish, uh, a grouper. 
So group aquaculture um, since 1970s, 70s until now is all well established. So we are able to see a lot of countries are doing well in group aquaculture. They are able to maximize the production in captivity. And this is a good sign in aquaculture. But the main challenges here in group aquaculture around the world is fish like grouper. They have a very slow growth. It requires a long production period and a lot of diseases have been reported and also they are very sensitive to environmental changes. They involve a very high FCR and also in the end it involves a lot of um, uh, production cost. This is a very um, common that we found in group aquaculture and it is not really an uh, economic way to produce them because in aquaculture it's all about business, it's all about profit, it's all about dollar and cents. We want something that can minimize our cost. I will give you an example of the mouse grouper. I have an experience working, uh, looking after mouse grouper. It was one of the most toughest um, experience for me to look after mouse grouper. They are very sensitive, they only need a very clean water and when the, the water quality started to deteriorate, they are unable to survive and also they, they grow very very slow it took about three to four years to 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 make them into marketable size and of course this FCR is very high so it is not recommended for for any of uh, group aquaculture operators to to continue for mass group but because we still um, need to produce them otherwise it's going to be finished in a while right so so Aquaculture, like mouse grouper, is of course a good uh, species in aquaculture because of the, the, the value of the fish is very high. It brings profit to the any operators, but we have to consider a lot of things as well. Like, like a mouse grouper, they have a very slow growth, they, have, they are very sensitive to disease. So these are the things that we need to tackle. And then, uh, yeah, especially they have a slow growth, a low survival, and weak to disease. So these are the three things that always been seen when we want to 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 do a mouse grouper uh, aquaculture so this is only an example of what we have seen in the pure grouper aquaculture so now is hybridization works on grouper so these are the things that comes in 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 aquaculture when you have been dealing with a fish with a very slow growth and of course when um, a lot of people they try to do fish bombing or they try to to catch more from the wild because they do not have option they want to have they want to supply this good quality of um, mouse grouper to the seafood industry but aquaculture are unable to 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 produce them because it takes a longer time so this is the reason why there is an unsustainable um, things happen in aquaculture of uh, mouse grouper can they solve a problem in 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 tackling the issue of slow growth, low survival, and weak to disease. So can they do that? So these are the things that um, these are the things that are very important to tackle off, right? Because we want to increase, we want to improve the production of grouper aquaculture. So in history, when we look back, grouper hybridization is not really really a new thing if we compare to how many years ago like 20 years ago so uh, an earliest work on hybrid grouper have been uh, documented by uh, a very good researchers and his team Glamzina et al and also James et al you can see here they already started the grouper hybridization work between the Epinephalus uh, marginatus and also um, Epinephalus anus at that time and of course this is only a preliminary and research scale but it serves a very uh, a very good um, fundamental information on um, to proceed to the group aquaculture later on so these are the only two papers that can be can be found um, working on the hybridization of, of grouper uh, 20 years ago and in 2006 and aquaculture especially the group hybridization become essential uh, uh, sensation uh, topics at uh, particularly particularly in Asia at the time because in in 2006 starting from uh, University of Malaysia Sabah my university we are able to produce a hybrid group at the time this is considered one of its kind in the world at the time because when we compare to 
to what uh, Glamazina et al. and also Jens et al. had done, it was only on uh, an early stage, a preliminary stage. But in 2006, we are able to, to produce a hybrid pupa up to the commercial stage. So in this case, in 2006, we are able to produce a hybrid tiger grouper crossed with the hybrid giant grouper, or we call it uh, as a tiger, uh, tiger GG or TGGG. So this is the starting point of hybrid grouper aquaculture um, itself. The, the differences here, you can see here, um, a long time ago, it was only in the laboratory scale, it was only on the research scale. But for the hybrid uh, TGGG, you can see that it dominated most of the seafood industry in, in, in Asia. A lot of advertisement, a lot of even every restaurant are offering uh, a selling hybrid grouper. Uh, hybrid grouper. It was a major hit in the seafood industry since 2006 until now. So, and because um, they grow fast, right? They grow fast in, in a year. They, they are able to, to reach to a marketable size. So at this time, we are able to offer a low price for, for, for the seafood industry. So it becomes heat at that time. And of course, the flesh quality is compatible to the pure grouper. So this is something that um, I can say a win-win situation between uh, an aquaculture and also a seafood uh, industry at that time. So in 2006, our university started this uh, hybridization week. We published a lot of papers on the, the, on the research part. So we studied thoroughly on the, the egg and also larva development until the sensory organs. And we compare with the, um, with the pure species. You can go, you can, you, you, you can go to, to, to any website, especially on the Science Direct website or Elsevier. You can see that we have published a lot of good papers there. So you can make this as a reference if you are going to study on the lava rearing um, or the lava stash of the grouper. So these are the earliest work on the hybrid grouper um, in the world, I think, um, in the commercial scale. So in 2006, actually how it happened, how we started this hybrid grouper was um, it was not a target at all. It was not our intention at the time to produce a hybrid grouper of TGGG because hybrid, hybridization of grouper never been considered before by our university because in our university we have a lot of pure groupers, we have all these pure stocks, so we, our intention was to produce all these good pure group but of course we encounter again the slow growth the the, the low survival the disease so we can encounter a lot of challenges so um, this is where actually the starting point of the hybrid group uh, tiger gg so our ultimate goal at that time we wanted to produce a giant grouper because you know giant grouper they can they grow very fast they can grow even up to two meter within how many years only so we want to have this kind of grouper in aquaculture so um, we can we can tackle the issue of slow growth. So, have you can see here? This is our giant grouper back in two thousand six. We always wanted to produce this fish, but as we know, okay, these are the, the of course the good thing about uh, giant grouper. They fast growth. They are very hardy. The price is good, and they have a high demand. So, it's perfect for aquaculture. Difficulties where. We know that giant grouper, they all are protogenous hermaphrodite, they change sex from female to male. So these are characteristic, of course, it's a very common in, in groupers and also other marine fish. But of course, in aquaculture, this is a headache for us because we are unable to control them because they will change from female to male. So when you are expecting eggs of a grouper, but when you check them, oh, they all already turn to male. So this is the things that are, are very difficult for us in aquaculture. So at that time, because this giant group of broodstock in our university, they tend to grow, um, to grow very fast. So we are unable to get a female. So even the female, we only can have a very short period of time. And when we are ready to get the eggs, they already tend to male. So we have a very limited female. And so this is always a, um, a factor of failure in our university, why we are unable to produce a giant grouper. So... Um, most of the time when we do a checking or selection of our groupers, only sperm that we are able to, to obtain, we are not able to obtain any eggs at that time. So um, I would like to share with you, this is the facility of hatchery that we have in our university, in our hatchery. 
we have all this crew stock of groupers in our hatchery we have a mouse grouper we have tiger grouper we have um, uh, orange spotted grouper we have a coral grouper we have a lot of groupers we have a lot of giant grouper and we have a lot of them so at that time we are unable to produce them as again because of the hemophodite characteristic so at that time we started to, to, to consider why not hybridization because we have a very good male of giant grouper that tend to grow very fast but in the same time we have all this very slow growth um, grouper they all are female they takes time to turn into male so why not we cross breed between them because they are from the epinephalus species as well so at the time we started to use the sperm of this matured male to cross breed with um, the eggs of of uh, a pure grouper that we have in our hatchery because at that time we aim to have um, to increase the harvestability and also we need to have the hybrid vigor so that you know some of the pure grouper they, they have very slow growth but only the giant grouper are very uh, are very very fast in terms of growth so we want to have the the, the characteristic from the giant grouper so we crossbreed them so in the end we got all these good things happen so we have this hybrid group with all this good uh, character or, or all this bonus for us at that time so it become a major hit or uh, in the group aquaculture at that time so from tiger gg we also produce a lot of group at that time we also produce a lot of groupers we have this og or orange grouper cross with the tiger grouper or the orange grouper cross with the giant grouper we have a lot of combination just uh, to find out which combination is the best at the time so out of all this i think as far as i can remember we have about 12 to 13 species of uh, hybrid grouper at the time but among them the hybrid tiger gg the, the the one that we cross with tiger grouper and giant grouper is the best among all of them because we can see that the tiger grouper or hybrid grouper at the time they have all this they have a super growth they, uh, they have also a high tolerance in terms of the environmental changes. They are very hardy, excellent fresh quality and lower production cost. So this is the best um, product of hybrid grouper I can consider at the time. So with this, a lot of hatcheries started to use this kind of technology. They're asking for technology. They're asking for all these methods from our university to be transferred to the community, to be transferred into the industry on we can see that the price has been fluctuated of course from 30 ringgit to 85 ringgit per kilo in the past 10 years and of course they are relatively uh, relatively cheaper compared to the pure grouper at the time because uh, we are able to produce in a mass quantity we are able to produce a lot at that time so uh, it is affordable for for industry or for the consumer to check in so when we compare between the pure grouper and also a hybrid grouper in terms of because in aquaculture we are always talking about money we are always talking about dollar and cents and profit you can see here in hybrid grouper it only involves a very low production cost while in pure grouper it maintains to require higher production uh, cost or production uh, yeah production cost so when you have a lower production cost of course in the same time you have a higher production rate so this is what we want or this is always a, a dream i think i can say that in group aquaculture so the feeding cost or the fcr has been uh, surprising low so normally the grouper is about five or six for the pure grouper even for the lowest so for this hybrid grouper is only 1.2 even i have done several um experiment the lowest that i can go is 0.8 and of course uh, have a shorter production period and of course it's it's very hardy it can accept almost a lot of uh, different types of feed at that time and when we talk about higher production rate of this particular hybrid, we see that they have a very um, a, a strong vigor there, where they are very hardy fish, even from the embryonic to adult stage. Because before um, the production of hybrid grouper, 
I always have a difficulty. I have always um, encounter with a, 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 a issue in handling all these pure grouper because they are very sensitive. They are very fragile. But when it comes to hybrid grouper, I have a very easy experience to looking after them because they are very, they are very hardy. They can tolerate wide range of um, water quality, so it's easy for 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 any operators of grouper aquaculture to have a tiger GG in their aquaculture. So in UMS hatchery, of course, our hybrid works um, mainly for research, teaching and training. But later on, when we transfer all this technology, it becomes a, a commercial scale. So because we are in the university, our core business is on re research and teaching and also knowledge transfer. So we've been doing this uh, since 2006, the first time we produced Tiger GG, a hybrid group, until now. There's still The technology is still transferring with uh, advanced um, knowledge and advanced uh, improved technology for the industry and for the hybrid grouper when we want to compare a, a, a growth you can see again uh, 700 gram within less than a year but for a tiger grouper the pure species is about two to three years or average is three years and we also have published a very good articles in um, reviews in aquaculture you can go through these papers we describe how how fast is the growth of this uh, hybrid grouper so that you can compare with the, the, the pure grouper. And again, the hybrid grouper, when you versus with the other pure grouper, again, a lot of study been conducted. You can see that a lot of research been conducted on hybrid grouper. They check either it's really true that they can tolerate wide range of um, water, uh, water quality and for example, salinity. So it's proven that they are able to stand for even slightly lower salinity and this will benefit to the to the communities nearby um, the brackish area not only in the coastal area because we know that in the coastal area maybe the salinity is higher but because of this fish they are able to tolerate uh, lower salinity now it benefits to those um, community that staying at the brackish area so a lot of papers have been uh, published on um, how hardy is the hybrid tiger GG towards the water quality, towards the changes of the, um, the environmental. And then, of course, uh, in terms of hardy fish, in terms of uh, disease resistant, I can say that the hybrid grouper, they have a higher resistance compared to pure grouper, especially in, um, in, in, in bacteria or viruses, diseases. So, you, we have a lot of good papers from our university as well. We have an expert working on the disease. So the, or the conclusion or the finding of most of the papers also are almost similar that the hybrid grouper, they show a superior characteristic in terms of fighting uh, a disease. So against all the disease. So this is the good thing about the hybrid uh, grouper of this particular species. And in terms of excellent flesh quality, because we've been selling or the industry have been selling this fish again and over and over again for how many years or so, 20 years until now. So why it's still dominating the industry of seafood industry is because of the flesh quality is actually undifferentiated with the pure grouper. They are has excellent has the, the pure grouper. So this is the good thing. Another good thing about the hybrid tiger GG. So the, 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 the excellent flesh quality. So these are some of the example of the restaurant, I think, especially around the world. They've been, you know, um, offering Tiger GG or the, the hybrid uh, grouper because of the flesh quality. Um, and then because a lot of works have been um, work have been done in the hybrid Tiger GG or hybrid grouper in especially around the world because of the good uh, characteristic or because of the hybrid vigor that we can see in 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 this particular species a lot of established work on disease or water quality and nutrition so a lot of things have been uh, conducted for the past 20 years so now what is the direction of hybrid grouper aquaculture since that we have all these well established uh, findings um, it's not only excellent in research but also benefit the commercial scale so what else that and what else that we have to improve in 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 our hybrid grouper aquaculture so for the past 20 years not only the production of hybrid grouper 
um, there are also several works that have been conducted to, to, to further improve or to further enhance uh, the production of hybrid grouper, including the attempts um, to produce um, a new combination of hybrid grouper in the captivity. And of course, we have achieved the full cycle of hybrid grouper in control condition. And the most important is we have further um, uh, improved or further advanced into the back crossbreeding, which I will share with you. Um, in the latter slide. So um, this is what I have shared with you just now. So for the past few years we have been produced, this is from 2006 until 2012, we have produced more than 10 species of hybrid grouper and there are new um, species have not been listed here, produced by other farm as well, for the, produced by other countries as well, even in China, in, in Japan and also in Taiwan. They have produce a lot of different species of hybrid grouper in the captivity. So this, what we have seen in the slide, is what we have in our university, that we have success um, um, to produce some of the species here. So of course, among them, again, only the hybrid between the tiger grouper and giant grouper is the most successful one. And sometimes, when you can see here in this photo, the most lowest part is the 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 crossbreed between the mouse grouper and also the giant grouper so this species because we we want this mouse grouper to grow fast but in the end this hybrid grouper they inherit um uh, the genetics of the growth of mouse grouper so the, the growth is quite uh, slow in this particular species so it's not recommended for aquaculture so the next one, um, of course, for the past 20 years, uh, we have um, achieved a full cycle of hybrid grouper and in the control condition where we have a very, very tight biosecurity, we do not um, release the fish, we do not um, make them escape to the wild. So this is what we have attained, um, we have achieved or we have established in our university to have a full cycle where we, you can see that when we have this hybrid fish back in 2006 and we found out that they actually uh, matured in the captivity after seven years because we have uh, done a lot of works on the gonad uh, grouper. You can see here we also publish a very good papers on the gonad maturation and sex determination of uh, hybrid grouper. After 10 years, you can see that they actually um, matured in the captivity. Um, uh, for the past 20 years, uh, yes, 20 years, for the past 20 years, uh, a very good uh, feeding management and also water quality monitoring been subjected to them. We place them in a very, uh, uh, we place them in a very, uh, what I say, a good biosecurity system of the tank. We product, we provide them a very good quality of food, just like other grouper. We even, um, uh, injected some of the vitamins or extra supplements into the feeds for them. So all this actually contributed to a better or to a maturations of their uh, gonad when they are rare in the captivity. We focus on or we, we monitor the water quality when we are culturing them. Even we clean most of the most of the time where the fish are placed. So with all these good combinations of water management from the uh, water quality management, from the feeding management, you can see that the fish is actually grow well in the captivity condition because they are fed well, they have been taken care of. And it happened in uh, in early 2016. Uh, what happened was in our brewstock tank, we had to, to, to let a technician to do a maintenance, a major maintenance in our hatchery at the time. So we have to transfer them from three meter height of tank so this is where we place them. So we have to transfer them because the, 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 the facility there is no longer safe to use. So we have to transfer them from 3 meter height of tank into a 1 meter low of tank size. So at the time, we didn't know it actually trigger um, uh, a maturation, not, not maturation. They trigger them to spawn because of the sudden change of the water depth. It triggered them to spawn and then to our surprise, the next the eggs. Uh, can be found in the tank. So it was a surprise for all of us at that time. So 
this is the first time that we actually uh, complete the full cycle of our hybrid grouper a very good quality of hybrid um, uh, f1 hybrid grouper we, we are able to the embryonic um, quality so we actually get about 32 kilos of eggs matured eggs at that time or fertilized egg it is very fantastic at the time and we are able to collect more than 960 millions of eggs and the fertilization development rate and hatching rate was fantastic it all over 90 percent so this again show a very strong hybrid vigor or the vigor characteristic of the f1 uh, hybrid grouper and when we compare with other grouper at the time with the with other other hybrid grouper you can see that only the hybrid tiger gg show a better result in terms of the bio uh, embryonic step the result at the time of our f1 and how they change from the larvae stage to metamorphosis is very easy to look after them during the winning process from different life feed to the artificial feed until the juvenile stage and we can see even the the spine formation is quite early when we compare to the other groupers so everything is um is good about this f1 grouper so they have a shorter larvae stage they enter juvenile as early as 35 days actually and we don't have any deformation recorded at that time so we conclude that um, they inherit a hybrid vigor they have a better quality of the, this F2 and the survival rate may higher because at that time um, it's comparable so but now we can we, we can share with you some of the findings of the recent findings that we have they even better in terms of the um, quality of the eggs of the even on the growth performance and yeah this is about um, the hybrid F1 then in our hatchery so this is the juvenile of our F2 sorry our F2 hybrid grouper and then now we have done all these new species we have done all this full cycle of hybrid grouper what else for the hybrid grouper aquaculture we move to the pet crossbreeding because not all hybrid grouper are able to grow as fast as the pure grouper as fast as the parental fish so we still try to get um, uh, a better uh, genetics materials from the giant grouper because it always um, good to revisit our ultimate goal at first we only want to produce the giant grouper but until now we are unable to produce them in the in the tank system so at that time we have a hybrid grouper of orange grouper crossed with the giant grouper or the short term is the OG GG, the orange grouper crossed with the giant grouper OG and GG. So they have a very slow growth compared to the hybrid tiger GG. So at the time we we did some back crossbreeding activities on them. We performed them to crossbreed between the OG and OG GG and the giant grouper, the parental fish. So we also success in doing this and we publish a very good papers on the egg dev um, giant grouper with the giant with the GG, the giant grouper, and one is the hybrid tiger GG, TGGG with the GG. So we have all these two new backcross um, species in, in Malaysia now. So it's still possible to have 75% uh, percent of genetic materials from the giant grouper. Hopefully they can grow as fast as uh, the giant grouper like uh, what the giant grouper have been performing uh, all this while um, when we compare these two the only two back cross uh, grouper I think in the world now we can see that it is only on the research level now because we just started the work uh, not a long time ago so we started this one this work and now we are still doing the research hopefully we can get um, a good findings to share with all of you on how hybrid grouper on how the group aquaculture um, has shifted from the pure grouper to the hybrid grouper and now to the back cross uh, breeding for, um, just um, you know to, to get a better threats to get a better genetic material so that we can fulfill the demands of the uh, aquaculture the demand from the seafood industry so that uh, we can minimize as well the overfishing of grouper in the well, so what I can conclude here for the back cross uh, breeding of grouper uh, in aquaculture is still under research now and but hopefully soon within this year or no uh, somewhere in next year I think we can share with you some of the good findings from our back cross breeding so just before I finish uh, my slide 
I would like to 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 highlight here. Even the hybrid grouper has been um a good uh a good fish. All this one in aquaculture because of all this characteristic, because of all this hybrid vigor. So we still have to 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 um, to consider how to do it in a responsible or more sustainable way. We are not because we have to understand this hybrid grouper is produced in the captivity. It's not naturally uh, available in the in the, in the ecosystem. So it is always good to keep them well in the captivity, and then we have to be more responsible, um, so that they will not be released again to the wild. So, but of course, as far as I concerned, I do not have any article that cr uh, that that cross with to saying that the hybrid is have been found in the in the in the natural environment but i do hope because of all these good things about hybrid grouper uh, aquaculture we hope all these uh, operators be more responsible so that we can really keep them uh, in the tight biosecurity and in terms of sustainable of course um, everyone is talking about a food security a national or global food security we always looking for something that we can produce in the fastest way so that we can feed the, the increasing human population so i think aquaculture can be one of the not can be is already there has a more sustainable um, food production so we need more people not only from the research area but of course from the industry to work um, closely with um, the academia to how we can actually come up with a, a sustainable um, aquaculture sustainable group aquaculture and for example in my university we have shifted to sustainable group aquaculture from the feeding management we are no longer using a trash fish or um, a, a pelagic fish for them to feed them we use a formulated feed even formulated feed we have shifted from uh, using a fish meal into an alternative uh, meal like a plant-based meal or or the black soldier insect meal so these are some of the ways in our university um, to produce uh, to introduce a sustainable uh, group of aquaculture and of course in in our university also we do not um, introduce any chemicals to treat our fish because we do not want these harmful uh, chemicals or that meant to be treat them while they are sick or while they are infected by a disease we do not want this um, residue or these uh, chemicals um, stay in the fish flesh or the flesh to be and then later on the consumer have to consume it so in our university not only on the feeding management we also focus on how we actually treat them with a non-chemicals uh, uh, substance for to treat to to handle them and so these are some of the sustainable uh, group aquaculture being practiced by my university so that it also of course benefit to our university because we are able to sell in the name of organic fish to the consumer because there is no no pesticide there is no antibiotic being used to to group us. so this is something that we want to see more and more industry uh, uh, practicing because we want to have a safe and uh, a, a quality fish to be marketed right so of course again i would like to highlight before i just end my presentation today handling is very important not to be released to the ecosystem or to be escaped to the environment so these are uh, i think the bring home message from my uh, my my slide today so i hope uh, with a very humble sharing with all of you you have um, a picture on how uh, what is going on in the hybrid grouper aquaculture where we have shifted from the pure grouper into the um, hybrid grouper and now to the back cross uh, grouper so that we can have more better better grouper that may be only a shorter production um, period of time so this is what we want okay so with this i would like to end my uh, slide today and presentation so thank you very much and terima kasih uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ching, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, now, uh, if you could just show up, please. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Mm. Hello. <laughs> well, we have some interesting questions here. Ah, nós yeah, temos okay. algumas perguntas aqui. Mm. 
as you have already mentioned, uh, your presentation is so, uh, astonishing for me uh, if you consider uh, some of the aspects you have already told about our situation, about uh, the number of groupers we have in Brazil, some of them yes. are already mm -hmm. threatened uh, to extinction, mm. but as you know, certainly know, uh, marine fish culture in Brazil is in its infancy. Mm. We haven't gone very far until now. So there is a lot of potential, but uh, not much has been done on, at commercial stage. We have a lot of experiments, a lot of research, mm. but at the commercial stage, we don't have much uh, culture of marine fish in Brazil. Well, I'll comment rapidly. Eu comentei rapidamente a questão da situação da, da, da piscicultura marinha no Brasil, que é bastante limitada, né? que nós temos muitas experiências é, de pesquisa, mas por coisa ao nível comercial, e que as garopas são, sem dúvida alguma, um grupo extremamente importante, com grande potencial para o cultivo no, na nossa região. Ok? É, vou levantar algumas questões de ordem de conservação, né? e algumas perguntas aqui também são com relação a isso. Ok? Uh, Dr. Ching, there's a lot of concern in Brazil about yeah. uh, uh, hybrid production in general, mm -hmm. fish, fish hybrid production, uh, because of the uh, potential risk of escapees getting yes. into the wild mm -hmm. and compromising the genetic pool. Yeah. Uh, what is your uh, opinion about that, considering mm -hmm. the reality in Malaysia? Uh, mm. your, your, your legislation is different from ours, of course, but we mm. have several restrictions here in Brazil, legal restrictions for mm. producing hybrids, especially of freshwater species. Uh, mm. But we have many, many freshwater fish mm. hybrids produced in Brazil. Among those you have mentioned. Yeah. I would like to hear your, your concern about that. Yeah, okay, thank you, Prof. I think uh, um, when, when we started the hybrid um, fish hybridization of, in aquaculture uh, back in 2006, for the first time in Malaysia at that time, we already considered about the, um, the biosecurity, about, uh, uh, about the escape of this fish to the wild. We do not, um, we do not, in uh, how, to, how, to, how to put it in words, we actually, uh, even until now, we are still, you know, working hard to tell to the people that this fish is actually meant to be produced only in the captivity. We do not want them to be released to the natural ecosystem. We know the circumstances. We know what will happen when this uh, new fish, we consider a new fish being released to the, to the ecosystem. And of course, it will disturb the whole genetic pools in the natural ecosystem. I think not only in Malaysia, but also in many parts of the world, uh, even on how we actually can release those fish, although they are very good fish, they are high growth fish in the aquaculture, but we are not allowed to, to release them. I think we have the same restriction, we have the same regulation as well. So that's why in the end of my presentation, I have highlighted that even until now, a responsible and sustainable aquaculture practice, especially on the fish hybridization is very important to be carried out. Mm -hmm. So I think we still have to work hard on this. I think not only in Malaysia, all around the world, we have to work yeah. hard on even the awareness. So because when we want to produce this hybrid grouper, we want to have something that very, you know, they can grow very fast so that we can meet the, the, the demand from the industry. Other than and just wait for the, the, the pure grouper to, to grow up to three years to four years. But this hybrid grouper, um, they can grow even in one year. So this is something that we want in the industry. But in the same time, we have to respect the, uh, the, the ecosystem. We are not able, you know, we cannot release them to, to the natural ecosystem. So I think the same opinion around the world, yeah. Uh, yeah. We have to consider that there is a potential risk since these yeah, fish are, yeah. not, are not sterile. Yeah. Yes, so they can yeah. they can breed uh, and, and yes. cross breeding may occur mm. anywhere. Yeah. Okay. I think natural hybridization also happen in the ecosystem. Yeah. So this has already been documented, right? In especially in the freshwater species, because I think the 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 the, the fecundity is even higher compared to the marine fish. It's already been documented. That's why we need to be more careful in terms of producing the the, the grouper hybrid. Yeah. 
Bom, ela comentou é, que as preocupações com a liberação de, de híbridos no ambiente natural não é uma exclusividade nossa, é uma preocupação do mundo todo, e que sempre houve, é, por parte deles, desde que começaram a produzir esses híbridos, uma grande preocupação com a biossegurança. É né? um aspecto que, obviamente, tem que ser considerado com muita atenção, embora é, isso é, necessite de ser melhor avaliado em qualquer, em qualquer lugar, não é diferente da situação na Malásia ou em qualquer outra parte do mundo. É, eu have some other questions here. Yes, é, uma pergunta é, por que não se faz repovoamento de garoupas puras, já que existe o domínio da reprodução e o manejo das fases iniciais? Uh, the, question, uh, the first question here is, why are there no attempts in carrying out fish supplementation, I mean, restocking, on uh, of these endangered species of grouper if uh, reproduction feeding management is already established okay in malaysia right. yeah okay pro um so restocking means whatever we produce in aquaculture and then we release them to the natural ecosystem to increase the production or productivity in the natural ecosystem but if we are talking about pure grouper restocking of pure grouper that is not easy because pure grouper naturally they are very you know they have a very slow growth if we are we are going to do a restocking or stock enhancement of pure grouper release them to the to the wild it's going to take years about three to five years just to you know to evaluate them to revisit them in the natural ecosystem either the restocking is already successful or if we can still you know to get back the whatever number that we have released in the initial stage so and pure group but they are very fragile the survival rate is very very low even when we release them it's very difficult to to, to monitor them so i think that's the reason why restocking of pure group is still you know is still in the early stage we are unable to do so but in in sabah especially here in my state here in malaysia we have a very successful restocking of freshwater fish we have this system we call it in in the local dialect we call it tagal system so this system we have a very successful story in um on the restocking of uh, freshwater fish perhaps in another presentation in the future i will share with you how it you know how it was done uh, um you know very successful in 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 here in malaysia uh, that would be very interesting but yeah, because yeah. we have we have a lot of restocking here, but uh, mm -hmm. the efficiency of such restocking is not very well evaluated. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Bom, okay. ela, ela falou que, que uh, essa questão da, do, a despeito da tecnologia disponível para as diferentes fases da produção, a resposta né, dos... Uh, do material produzido das espécies puras é demorado, leva muito tempo para obter a maturidade e a sobrevivência é baixa, então isso tem inibido as ações com restoque, com restocagem, né? repovoamentos, enfim, embora elas tenham experiências bem sucedidas em água doce. Okay? Uma outra pergunta, em escala comercial, os produtores produzem o híbrido or they just eat the seeds? Okay, the question is, at, uh, at the commercial scale, do the farmers have to produce the hybrids or they just grow the seedlings? They uh -huh. just grow the... Okay, so in Malaysia, our hybrid group is already established. We have both. We have the hatchery, the farmers produce their own seed, and also we have the grow-out system. So the both... Um, system we have um, to produce the seed and also to the grow out. So both are already well established here. Yeah. Okay. So the technology has already been transferred to farmers, yes. and yes. some of, yes. some of these farmers are specialized in producing seedlings. Yes. Some of yeah. them may produce seedlings and also uh, uh, um, cultivate fish until commercial size. Yes. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Bom. Mm. Enfim, uh, acho que deu para entender, mas é, na Malásia isso já está bem, bem avançado, então existem já é, produtores de é, alevinos, no caso, usando a nossa terminologia aqui, é, que fazem isso ou que também produzem, não somente os seus próprios alevinos, como também vão até o nível de engorda. Okay? É, uma pergunta que eu gostaria de fazer também é com relação ao papel do financiamento governamental 
nas pesquisas né, que contribuíram para o domínio dessa tecnologia na Malásia. Uh, Dr. Ching, uh, I, would yeah, like to, I would like to know a little bit about the role of uh, uh, governmental financial support for research and technology development of Grupa in Malaysia. How did it happen? Was there any special investment, governmental investment for that? Mm, okay, okay, probably. On its, uh, on its, on its beginning, huh? Mm. So when we started the hybrid group uh, um, project back in 2006, so when we see all this, um, uh, you know, uh, the benefit to the industry, so from that moment start, um, our university, even university have, um, you know, they appointed as a flagship for us in our institute to do more research on the group uh, hybrid uh, project. So this is another form of uh, financial assistance from the university, but also the government, they have already acknowledged the technology of hybrid group in Malaysia and more and more funding uh, provided by the government uh, to, to encourage more farmers, to encourage more industry in Malaysia to involve more on the, the aquaculture. Yeah, we have the support from not only from the university and also from, from the, uh, especially the fisheries department, yeah. Bom, é, enfim, ela ressalta né, que independente ou além dos investimentos da própria universidade para o desenvolvimento dessa, desse pacote todo, mas sem dúvida houve também aporte governamental de estímulo ao desenvolvimento da, da tecnologia. Um, uh, we have a question here. You may not be... You may not be... Uh, totally aware of it, but there is a lot of concern of hybrid production in the Amazon region, uh, mm, Brazil. Mm, the mm. Amazon region is one of the uh, regions in the world with the highest yeah. fish biodiversity. Yes, yeah. So, uh, what is, uh, the question is, what is your opinion about producing hybrid fish in Amazonia? So, first of all, I, I know that Amazonia is one of the biggest, I think, in the world in terms of, um, you know, they have a high diversity in terms of fish, right, fish species. So, again, here, I would like to highlight that creating a new fish, it shouldn't be introduced in the natural ecosystem. We have to, you know, bear in mind that hybrid fish, whatever fish that meant to be for human consumption, especially in aquaculture, should be kept in the captivity, should be, you know, they just produce in the hatchery and then after that, even they reach to market the basal, either in the hatchery or in the pond system, it should be remained there. It should not be introduced in the next agree with this. We do not want to disturb the natural, you know, ecosystem of it. So, okay. even though they are a lot of benefits of hybrid fish right so but we but aquaculture is very different we want to produce for human consumption we want to produce to meet the demand so that's why it's very important to have the awareness that creating a fish the high growth fish is meant for aquaculture meant for human consumption it's not meant wow. to be released yeah. yeah so please do not release into the amazonia system yeah. ecosystem yeah <laughs> Bom, ela resposta que, em suma, que a aquicultura é para a produção de alimento, não é para estar soltando peixe na natureza. Então, ela também não recomendaria isso na Amazônia. A gente sabe que o problema é um pouquinho mais complexo do que isso, né? principalmente quando você cultiva peixes e que não há uma consciência ou não há uma garantia de que esses peixes não vão escapar para o ambiente natural. Enfim, hum, deixa eu ver aqui... É uma questão que está aqui também é se foi avaliada a fecundidade de fêmeas híbridas em comparação com a natural. Uh, another question is about uh, um, female fecundity comparing uh, hybrid females to the natural ones. Was it higher, bigger, lower? What is the comparison of fecundity between hybrid females and 
So from our study in terms of um, the fecundity of female grouper between the hybrid and also the pure grouper, they are all the same. It takes about seven to 10 years to develop the gonad maturation. But so far, we only found on two species of hybrid grouper that are able to, you know, to, to mature in the captivity, but the rest is, um, the rest are sterile. Yeah, so in terms of the comparison, they're all the same. Um, pure grouper and hybrid grouper, the gonad maturation, the fecundity are the same. Yeah, it takes the same years to mature. It takes the same size to, to reach the maturation stage. Yeah. Um, ba -ba -ba, let me see. Ah, I think this is the last question. Uh, mm -hmm. Existe algum acompanhamento dos dados dos produtores em comparação com os dos pesquisadores? Se refletem uh, os rendimentos a mesma coisa que visto em laboratório? The question is about the uh, the performance of fish growth at commercial stage, uh, mm -hmm. the same as you have uh, obtained in, in in your plant in your laboratory. Or um, you mean in different system? The one that we have in our mm -hmm. system is the tank system and also in the pond system? Yeah, and commercial, how is the commercial system, uh, how the, is the commercial production system in, in Malaysia? It is, is it similar to the, the, the conditions you have at your university or not? And if it, they, are, they have the same conditions, the performance is the same, is similar or not? Yeah, yeah, almost the same. But as we know, when we culture fish in the tank system, because in our university, we only have a tank system using a tank. And of course, the one that use a pond system, they have a slightly better in terms of growth, but it's still not really a significant difference, we can say, um, in between these two different systems. But I think it's almost the same. Yeah. Almost the same, yeah. Yes. Uh, I, yeah. I, okay, uh, I have another question. Uh, yeah. Do you have any experience in Malaysia in rearing mm. groupers in, in, in pond nets in the mm. wild or only in tanks? In there, in terms. Yes, please. Yeah, we have different system here. We have in a tank system, we have in a pond system, and also some are even go to the sea catch system. Yeah, we have different system. There. Even in the tank system, some are introducing a flow through system, some are using RAS system, just like other fish species. We have a different system here. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, Dr. Ching, I yeah. think these were, these were the, main, yeah. the main questions here. If are there mm. any questions mm. that uh, have not been addressed, they may be sent to you by email and yeah, sure, have, yeah, by all means, please, may yeah, kindly answer them and we yes. will make them available. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you, you again very much yeah, for your for having, Prof. Yeah, thank you very much participation here. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Prof. To William. Have thank your you. Your experience uh, and mm -hmm. the, the very interesting research you are. Uh, conducting in, in Malaysia with groups. Mm -hmm. I, I you, wish you all the best, all the success. Yeah, thank on you, it. Prof. Okay? Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Uh, agora eu passo então a palavra ao professor Alfredo. Okay? Bye bye then. Thank bye, you. Bye, thank you. Bye, Prof. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Ching. Obrigado. Thanks, Dr. Ching. Obrigado, Professor William. Então, eh, hoje estamos finalizando as tarefas da manhã. Foram muito produtivas, muito que aprender em aquicultura. Foi uma lição que nos estão dando os pesquisadores asiáticos. E agora eh, vamos passar alguns vídeos e de tarde nos estamos encontrando para a sessão da tarde em tudo referente a a camarões, começaremos com bioflocos, passamos a genética, nutrição e terminamos com microalgas. Então, muito obrigado pela atenção a todos. Eu sou o Gênesis, fecha formado pela Universidade Federal Rural de Pernambuco em 1900.
em 79. Antes de me formar nos primeiros, nos últimos meses de curso, eu fiz um estágio supervisionado no IPA de Serra Talhada com construção de viveiro da Estação de Psicultura de lá. Né? Mas logo depois que eu me formei, eu ingressei, eu, eu, tive, atividade, eu tive uma atividade de quase um ano com um pesca artesanal no município de Maragogi, de Alagoas, onde vivi embarcado em barco sete metros e meio. Em seguida, entrei no serviço público, através da Secretaria de Agricultura, Reforma Agrária, onde fiquei várias vezes à disposição de outros órgãos. O IPA por duas ou três vezes, onde eu estou permanecendo até hoje. E é, a Secretaria Especial de Agricultura e Pesca, que eu participei da gestão do governo do presidente Lula. Lula né? Então, pois bem, nesse processo todinho, eu trabalhei é, em prol da categoria, participando como entidade de classe, onde eu fui, fui presidente da Sociedade de Pesca de Pernambuco por três mandatos. Em 1990, né, 89, e dois últimos vigentes. Conselheiro do CREA de Pernambuco, por dois mandatos, lá em 1990, onde lá a gente construiu a primeira Câmara de Engenharia de Pesca, primeira e única, com a participação do presidente Oswaldo Fonseca, arquiteto daquela época, e nos apoiou, e um grande grupo de engenheiros de pesca que participou, eu, Leonardo, é, Augusto, né, participaram desse, nessa, dessa construção junto conosco. Né? Em seguida, eu tive a oportunidade de além do CREA, é, tive a oportunidade em 1990 de ser presidente da Federação Nacional de Engenharia de Pesca do Brasil, participei do processo constituinte do sistema CREA, participamos do Colégio de Entidades Nacionais, onde era, foi uma verdadeira luta, e nesse processo também quando se criou o primeiro movimento em prol do Ministério da Pesca e Agricultura, que deu, uma, anos mais tarde, com o presidente Lula, em 2013, a nível de secretaria, e depois se transforma em Ministério anos depois. Pois bem, a Associação de Pesca Pernambuco vai fazer agora em, em janeiro de 1900 e 2000, 2021 43 anos de, de existência. Então, os, os regressos do, do curso de engenharia de pesca de Pernambuco vieram de lá. Né? O primeiro presidente foi Raimundo Evangelista Neto. Raimundo Evangelista Neto teve um grande mérito de, de, de ir até Brasília e brigar para que o curso fosse reconhecido. Né? Naquela época, era, é, ele, ele sofria de ameaças do curso. Como chegou, quando chegou em Brasília, também ele teve contato com o curso e, fruto da sua articulação, gerou é, a resolução 279-83, barra anos posteriores, que dá as atribuições da engenharia de, de pesca, que é um grande avanço. Né? Eu gostaria de estar Lembrando, depois teve a gestão de Itamar, eu, de é, Claudio Milso, que e, na época de Claudio Milso, ele, ele inseriu num documento a, a necessidade que o setor pesqueiro continental fazia peixamento em praças públicas, com fins eleitoreiros. E anos depois eu presenciei no governo Miguel Arraes uma transformação que era é, levar peixe a, diretamente à comunidade, que foi uma inovação que o secretário Pedro Gênesis, saudoso Pedro Gênesis, colocou e a gente ia para as comunidades ao entregar um caminhão carregado de alevinos para aquela comunidade. Nunca uma comunidade tinha recebido políticas públicas. E naquela época a gente chegava lá para a comunidade e tinha recebido aos gritos com um reconhecimento. Então, nós participamos de, dessa fruto, dessa, 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 dessas conquistas que a Associação de Pesca se deu muito em 1990, quando o Clube de Engenharia era nosso parceiro onde nossas reuniões eram até tarde da noite. E, por ser tarde até a noite, a gente planejou muito para a pesca, para a agricultura, muitas conquistas, criou um comitê de pesca e agricultura, fruto das nossas reivindicações, onde teve gestores nossos, engenheiros de pesca, participando, né? reivindicamos a política nacional, fizemos um congresso de engenharia de pesca em Santo São Paulo. Então, é, fizemos um grande ato, que foi o ato de replantir do mangue no Capibari, mostrando que as políticas municipais podem se tratar de, também dessa forma. Participamos também do, da, do apoio do professor Curique, que fazia o repovoamento do Rio Capibari, porque tem que cuidar. Pois, pois bem, 
Depois segui um, 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 os outros nossos colegas, Ricardo Moço, é, Ronaldo Frei, é, Sérgio Matos, Sérgio Catonda, é, Sileno, professor Vanildo e tantos outros. Tantos outros que nós temos aqui a agradecer e dizer que hoje nós somos engenheiros de pesca com muita luta, com muita conquista, porque nós temos um grupo unido. Esse grupo unido tem vencido muitas batalhas, documentos solicitados dos governos estaduais que tivessem uma política para pesca e cultura. Não chegou a ser ainda o que a gente queria, mas avançou em algumas coisas e mostramos que, que nós existimos. Nós existimos, nós queremos mais do que estamos tendo até agora. Nós queremos um setor que valorize, né? que valorize a, a, a classe da engenharia de pesca, tanto no sistema Confiacrea, que precisamos fiscalizar melhor o segmento da pesca e cultura. Pois bem, eu deixo essa mensagem que a Universidade Federal Rural de Pernambuco que fruto da, da, da luta da Sociedade Federal Rural de Pernambuco, que outros os tentáculos da Associação de Pesca de Pernambuco, que luta pelas consequências, pelas conquistas coletivas do setor pesqueiro. E que são 50 anos de muitas pessoas que nós também premiamos, como Cuic, Lorinaldo, Luiz Lira, e tantas pessoas que vieram da universidade, nos ensinou, nos ensinou né? Fritz, Fernando Ferro e tantos outros profissionais, que Oswaldo Fonseca, Paulo Rubio Santiago, que deu a lei que, da engenharia de pesca, do dia do engenharia de pesca. Então, nós temos muito que comemorar e muito a estar junto cada vez mais, porque nós temos um grande caminho a traçar e unidos nós seremos mais fortes, em um cardume mais coeso. Um grande abraço.